put the volume on that. You have to turn your microphone off. You have to unmute. You have to put the little bar on your microphone. Should do. Uh, put the, uh, turn off your volume. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Marnie. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Hi Jesse. Hi, I'm going to grab something. So we are recording already. I thought that was a landing. There's no way we're going to be able to see a presentation with the sun. I know. I wonder if somebody saw. The sun will move. Five months. <laughs> is there like a stick or something to close those? Oh, no, no, no. Unless there's somebody call. Oh, the other ones are longer. <laughs> longer. They didn't. Last time they took something and just sort of pushed them down. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like a broom or. Oh. Hmm. There's a step stool in the in the copy room. I'm not sure it's high enough. No, step stool is on the stairs too. Step stool. <laughs> step stool. Yeah, I think it'll go behind the trees. Yeah, hopefully the sun goes down there. Can everybody hear? Nina, you can, I mean, uh, you can be right here. I'm right here. Good. Karina, you can hear us, right? Yes. Okay. Can we start there? No, I just want to make sure you get the right PowerPoint. It takes a lot to load. Okay. Good evening. It's Monday, August 1st, uh, 2022. This is a meeting of the South Girl Planning Board. And the first thing, oh, call to order. And the first thing on the agenda is 200 Turnpike Road. Karina, do you want to update us on that? Sure. All right. So at the last planning board meeting, let me just open my page here. Glasses. Yeah. On July 11th, um, the planning board had asked me to uh, work with the applicant for 200 Turnpike, uh, the uh, landscaping contractors facility, um, to suggest and recommend to them that they withdraw without prejudice um, due to the fact that um, out of so many meetings, they had only attended three. Um, and the progress was pretty slow and there was still some more to go, et cetera. So um, we received a letter from um, attorney Michael Norris on behalf of Jonathan Crandall of, um, I, mean, I just wanna get the name of the company, right? Because the letter is uh, CMJ Ventures LLC, the owner of the property at 200 Turnpike Road requesting to withdraw the major site plan approval application and special permit lower impact development application uh, without prejudice. Um, so they submitted a formal letter. So that's what they're requesting of the town, uh, of the planning board, I should say. And um, they both indicated that they would be here this evening uh, to speak to this. Sure. Um, did you hear anything different, Colleen? No. Let me get back to the Zoom here. Okay. Um, if anyone is in the attendees list in the attendee room um, related to this, they should raise their right hand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're there in person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, you're as bad as I am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Norris, I'm here on behalf of CMJ Ventures LLC. With me is Jonathan Crandall, the owner of the company. Uh, to begin with, uh, we'd like to apologize to the board for all of the continuances. We were working with the engineer. Unfortunately, 
things don't always work out the way you want and they get delayed. And uh, at this point, uh, we have hired a new engineer. Peter Bemis will be taking over the uh, process. He's working on new plans, uh, revised plans that will be submitted when he's ready and when they're all done and they're complete. Um, at this time, we're asking the board to withdraw the major site plan and special permit applications without prejudice and also requesting that the board waive the applications fees for the recent minutes. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them for you. And again, we apologize for all of the uh, meetings and not only was it a convenience to you, it was certainly a great inconvenience to my client who's been trying diligently to get this project approved. Thank you. Okay. So, um, should we vote on the withdrawal without prejudice and then discuss the way to leave? Um, well, I think, well, first of all, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. And um, for understanding the withdrawal, I think it's appropriate and everything, not only for us and you, but also for the public who, anyone who's been watching, you know, the same thing, probably a little frustrated. Uh, sure. As the service, um, I think the uh, yeah. If everyone agrees to accept the withdrawal, uh, um, then you know, we can discuss the the waiver of the fees now because if we have to close the public hearing and then vote to accept the. We still have to close the public hearings. Oh, okay. Um, and then once we do that, there should be no more discussion. So. Um, probably if you want to discuss the waiver of the fees, I'd be able to do that. Um, Before we close the public hearing? You can make it all in one motion. Yeah, we make it all in one motion. We'll come back later at a later date and make these. So, we'll oh, okay. All right. So, discussion. <laughs> so, I'm recused. Okay. And Jesse? Uh, hi, Karina, has the fee already been collected from the proponent? Yes. So we're really just talking about holding the fee for the, the next submission. Well, there are three fees involved. So there's an application fee for the major site plan approval, which is, I just can't remember, it's either 700 and 20 or 580, one or the other. Then there's an application fee for the special permit for LID, which is one of those two fees. Then there's an engineering consultant review fee, which is provided that goes into a retainer um, for which um, Fuss and O'Neill gets paid for their review. And as that gets worked down, um, often there's supplemental review required and they provide additional fees for that. So um, the money that's in the account now for the engineering consultant review, which is Fuss and O'Neill, would stay there. Um, and depending on um, how much is left, because they recently provided $3,000 supplemental, but there was a review done, um, a, a one more review on submission number four. So there may be some money left in there that just stays in that retainer account. However, the application fees, they go into a different account and those are used to cover the costs of um, the planning staff's time to process the application and to review the application for completeness and then to forward it um, and move into the public hearing phase, uh, which requires legal ad, et cetera, the, you know, doing the administrative tasks for that. Um, so if, an, you know, so, those application fees are used up from the first applications. Um, we process those applications and work through it. Um, I know that in the past, sometimes the planning board has, well, I can't say that. I can't recall exactly, but they may have in the past waived an application fee if, if it was something that wasn't going to be a big change and that it was just gonna pick up from where it left off. Um, just understand that we do have to uh, look at the applications again for completeness to make sure everything's there. So, um, Mimi, I would be in favor of waiving the fees if the uh, town hadn't incurred expenses as a result of 
um, choices by the proponent. If, if, if the, if the, if the issue was something on the town's part, I would be more inclined to waive the fees. But in this instance, I don't see that. So I don't see a reason to waive the fees. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, I, I'd be in favor of waiving the fees. I mean, if, it, if we just keep going the way we've been going, we're talking about the, the same process where I think, you know, Karina and Tony are going to be going through reviewing everything. And uh, I, I see the only fee that would be new would be that we have to put a notice in the paper again uh, saying we're going to open it. That's the only And, and to that, that, Andrew, the applicant pays for that directly. So, I mean, I, otherwise, we're just going to keep going down this until you know, Hong Kong signs off on things. It's just going to keep getting delayed. It, it's, I don't see the difference personally. Uh, I'd be in favor of waiving the fees since there's already a retainer piece in there. They're going to have to uh, pay additional with plus one meal that's going to go beyond what they're already have in the, the kitty for that. Um, so to me, I don't see the need to plug in. Um, so I just want to acknowledge what I've heard, think I've heard from our town planner. I think it's been a lot of um, work administratively on the town planner to be able to facilitate this. I understand she's under salary and um, it's kind of comprised of her job. So I think that um, recognizing the burden of the lift for our town planner to be able to go through the plan, she's going to have to do that again now that you've had hired a new engineer. Um, I just want to recognize that and at least be cognizant, cognizant of that as we proceed through the next round when you do come back, but I would be in favor of waiving the fees um, at this time. Um, just to speak on this for a minute. <clears throat> um, so the first engineer, Peter, who's, who's agreed to take on the project, he was the first choice to hire and he, he um, wasn't able to take it on at the time. And I went with the reference to somebody else and um, either here or there, it just was a challenge. Um, personally for me, I'm not, a, I'm not a large conglomerate, I'm a small company. And this has been well over six figures of the cost for me that I've lost. It's just gonna be gone, um, which is not your problem at all. And it, the fee waiver wasn't even something I asked for. It was actually suggested to me by the town. So I'd be very grateful if you, if you do that, but, um, just want to take that in consideration as well. And I know we, you know, we need to get a correct, good proposal to to the town and to yourselves. And that's what we're looking to achieve. At the end of the day, we want to make sure it's done right. And we just want to get to work. <laughs> you know, so and I and I think you're all on the same page with that if, as long as it's done right. So um, but I really appreciate the you know consideration and, and again, you know, the quality isn't really Michael's, it's mine. So um, yeah, that's all I have to say. So I apologize. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, my opinion is that we're still pretty far away. There, are, I know comments that I made in the first submittal that weren't addressed by the third submittal. So I think we're pretty far off. I would be in favor of refunding fees if things moved along and things were submitted timely and comments were. Uh, uh, addressed in a timely fashion, but um, it's been a lot of uh, a lot of administrative work for both the town planner and for Colleen, you know, constantly trying to follow up, are we gonna make, make this hearing, are we gonna make this hearing? So would anyone be in favor of refunding fees if things move along instead of waiving fees from the beginning? Refunding fees. Well, so I guess help me understand that then, because they're if they withdraw without prejudice, then yeah. they have to resubmit. Yeah. And you're saying they have to pay the, pay pay the, the fees. fees, and if things are submitted things go timely, smoothly, we'll then we refund. refund them. Then they're incentive to um, move things along. My only question would be. Um, how easy is that? 
We have done that before, haven't we, Karina? Uh, we did it in the case. Uh, yeah, we did it in the case on a modification where um, the applicant wanted to change a street name um, on their approved subdivision plan. And in the end, they decided not to move forward. Um, so yes, we have, and it was partially refunded. Uh, we calculated the time we had spent in initially processing it and then refunded, uh, re asked the board to refund the rest. Um, I, I, um, I don't know if that was a precedent set or not. It was when I first started and um, it, it seemed the way to go because they, it was very initial into the application um, when they withdrew. Um, so this is a little further into the application. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, it, the initial has been used up, but for the next round, if that's the case, um, I'm my only, and I wanna be objective here is that um, if you set a precedence of uh, when people withdraw, they may ask in the future, but each case is um, its own case in context. So um, I, I'm neither here nor there with it. I, I, I try to stay a little bit in, you know, um, on the fence because, you know, I do have to review it and um, I'm going to review it in the normal time it would take me to re review whatever they're submitting to me. And hopefully what they submit is um, complete since they have the experience now. Um, if Peter B misses the new engineer, he should know the requirements of the applications and what's required uh, to make a complete application. So um, the client, the applicant has been, um, although it's been lengthy, has been um, cordial and um, professional and responsive when it came to asking things outside of the design. Um, so I can say that um, it's it's really the design that took longer um, from that perspective. But they have been responsive when asked um, on administrative types of issues. So, so we'll give I, a time. <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I'm, help me uh, understand that. So if, if we kept going the course that we're on, there would be no additional cost other than if there was additional time needed from bus and meal that they'd have to pay. Right? Well, and, well, Karina still reviews all the applications and says this is missing that. Right, missing. but there'd be no new fees for that, right? Well, it's a new application. No, no, I'm saying if we continue the way without the withdrawal. Right, right. So in that path, it's, there's still going to be, if, if we were to go that route, continue as we have been, there's still going to be a, another review and everything else that would still happen. Right. Exactly. And there would be no new fees that would come in. Right. Where in this case, we're going to have a break. They're going to get everything lined up. There's not going to be any follow up or anything from the planning department until a new submittal comes in and it's clean and it feels ready to go. And then be one one review of us that it's going to be clean and ready to go. Otherwise, we're going to it's going to be this drip drip drip. Right. Um, oh, Mimi. Hey. Yes, Jesse. Uh, if I could just uh, address what Mr. Mills just said. I, you know, we we do have the authority to uh, reject applications due to incompleteness. So it's not technically correct in my view that we could just continue on this path of um, indefinite, unlimited extensions on this submission. Thanks. Agreed, but you know, so if being a good partner with the applicant, you know, the way I'm viewing it is we wanna see it all get done. We're trying to move things along, you know, if we continue the way we have then there's no new fees gonna come in. You know, we, we know an application is still gonna come in, it's just that we, we're gonna have a break. We're gonna be able to get everything in order and then we'll pick up from that point. Uh, and then if there's additional fees from Plus and O'Neill, they're gonna have to pay it anyway. That's, again, that's my view, unless, 
there's, by the way, there's zero incentive for me to take any longer than I possibly need to. I'm <laughs> losing, I mean, I, it's embarrassing to say how much money I'm losing right now per month by this not being done. So it, there's no incentive for me to drag this out. And it wasn't, I don't want to get, you don't need to know the backstory behind everything, but. It was frustrating for us. I can't imagine how frustrating yeah. it was for you. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> It's a good way to put it. The only compromise that I would say, Mimi, I mean, obviously for kind of, I, I hear you and Jesse and I hear me and, and um, Andrew, the compromise would be, I think it's hard, right? Without very clear milestones delineated right. as to what would you be required. So is there a, I, I mean, this would be kind of changing the way we do things, but what if like a, the third, like the third time, it's like that three strikes, if they've asked for three continuances at that point, they have to pay all the fees. And if, the, if you would agree to that. To me, it's a it's generous to get the fees back. So it doesn't make, you know, that's that'd be great. Yeah. What do you think of that idea, Jesse? I can go with that if that's the will of the board. Okay. So they would say they, they, they we would have to agree that they withdraw without prejudice. They would then reapply without fees. However, if we get to a third of a meeting where we have to continue for the third time, all fees would then be implemented at that point. But you said continue from because it's taking so long. Right. Either the engineering plans, like to point to Mimi's points, like the the what she had suggested on the first meeting had never been implemented on the subsequent plans. We have Fusso and Neil come through. Uh, or uh, they, could, they could do a continuance for a year. Right? I'm just, I'm just playing. I don't think you would, but I do. <laughs> right? So, I, I mean, it, like, I'm going to say if it's, if it's not complete in four months, I think that's more feasible. I, I think you have more experience than I do on these you projects. So, that makes sense. Because we do a continuance based on what the applicant right. requests. So if yeah. the applicant can request a continuous for six months, that would be one. And another continuous for another six months, that would be a year. And I, I, I'm just, right. and again, I don't think worst case scenario. Do I get it. So, um, so I would say, okay, if we can't wrap it up in five months, we might pay the fees. Okay. Also recognize that we're talking about approximately $1,200 for two application fees, 580, 720, so maybe $1,300. Um, if the applicant is you know, serious about submitting a complete application, then it should only take me maybe half the time to review it for completeness. So another avenue could be to say, um, um, maybe we expect 50% application fees half the application fees since you've already submitted there should be a lot of paperwork already in place certificates of authority they just have to redo the application to update it to refile it as far as the application form um, you know those types of things we have uh, template memos already in place that would go out to town departments to review to have their reviews um, we have a legal ad already prepared that we would just reuse so um, you could probably meet halfway and say, well, since you are coming back and a lot of these documents just need to be tweaked as far as the legal ad, um, memos that accompany submissions, et cetera, um, it would cover the cost of you know, actually looking at to make sure everything is there. But there's a savings because we don't have to redo all those forms except for you know, update them update those documents. So another way is say 50% of the fee, um, but that doesn't incentivize uh, with a time frame as- I like, you know. I like to complete the five months. <laughs> what do you think, Jesse? Sorry, I just have some, some issue there. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm fine with what Karina just said. Um, and I also hear the proponents, you know, frustrations on their side of things. 
And I certainly understand that there's no incentive on his part to delay. So um, in the interest of, um, you know, some, you know, being a fair partner with, with the business, um, I, my initial feeling on this is if the town's been spinning its wheels this long and, you know, I kind of felt like my time was wasted as a planning board member. Um, but um, having said that, I'm, I'm fine with, with the compromise that Karina just laid out. Thanks. As, a, as opposed to the complete in five months uh, that Mr. Mills proposed? Um, it, it seems like what Karina proposed is a little bit easier to enforce, but I'm fine either way. I'll make a motion that we uh, waive the fees unless uh, the applicant cannot get everything to completion in five months. Second. I have a motion and a second. Do we need to close the hearing first or is this open the hearing? All in favor, Latrell, yes. Mills, yes. Stein, yes. Yes. Oh, anyone from the public before we close the hearing? There are ten attendees in the Zoom room. Um, and nobody has there? their hand up. Okay. I'm trying to make a motion. We uh, close the public hearing for 200 turnpike roads, no removal landscaping, contractor facility, major site plan uh, approval. And we also close the public hearing for 200 turnpike roads, snow removal, landscape, uh, contractor facility, special permit for LID. Second. I have a motion in the second. Any discussion? All in favor of trial, yes. Mills, yes. Stein, yes. Stein, yes. Uh, I'm sure I make a motion that we accept the applicant's uh, request to withdraw without prejudice. As presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, Latrell, yes. Mills, yes. Stein, yes. Stein, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look Thank forward you. to Goodbye. seeing you again soon. Same here. Thank you. Hopefully on a, on a good note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a presentation by Christina Bazanson on urban forestry management. Welcome, thank you very much. Debbie, do you wanna say anything by way of introduction? Well, I'm just happy to say a few words and happy that um, Christina is able to join us. Um, I first reached out to Christina maybe a couple months ago um, so you can see you can see um, her work as an arborist and um, also having grown up in Southborough. Um, so she really knows our town and I think um, can help us at least um, start this process of um, you know, turning a new, a new direction, I guess, with our um, uh, way that we manage um, trees. And what struck me uh, most was that you know, we have been and have been so focused on a removal of trees, which is sort of our issue right now. But Christina started talking to me about how to also take care of healthy trees. <laughs> and so that started this conversation. And I'm delighted that she's able to join us tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. My back. <laughs> Um, and everybody on Zoom land, hello. But yeah, thank you so much. And I am very honored to, to speak here. I, I do talk to a lot of towns and civic groups, but um, to come back here to Southborough is wonderful. My parents still live on Deerfoot Road. I am a product of um, the public schools of Southborough. I was in first grade when Margaret Neary opened up and I went to Woodward and then off to Algonquin. So. It's real fun to come home. And I've seen Southboro change over the years. And, you know, I have obviously paid attention to the trees. And I'm happy to say there's way more trees in Southboro now than there were when I grew up. 
but there's also way more people. Yeah. And, and to have that happy balance of living with people and trees, um, you've got to have some uh, guidelines in place. So um, Colleen, next slide. Could I just ask for the um, benefit of the Zoom viewers, if that screen can be shared? Oh, I'm not sure. Christina, there's way more trees because there's way less farmland. Good point. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, New England is a forested state. And, um, but, you know, when we will get into this, but the the lack of mowing the lack of grazing animals and where we are it just you just stop one little patch of mowing and stuff's going to grow back whether so it whether it's planned reforestation or unplanned reforestation there there are more trees but yes a lot less farms colleen it may be easier if somebody else shares the screen then you don't impact the the um the screen on behind you. So if you share your, if somebody else shares the desktop image, then you don't, then you can leave your presentation on the projector because it should, it should be two different things. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Is, it, yeah, yeah. is the presentation um, in Dropbox? Yes. Okay. It is. I can do that. If you want to give me a um, second to look at it. Is it the same one? Yeah, on Dropbox? all I did was change the date on the first slide, so we're good. You know, maybe you can just give us a little bit about the background. So you had okay, so yeah, so yeah, while, while we're doing the technical difficulties. So um, yeah, other than growing up in Southboro, um, I um, spent a lot of time, my mom is an artist, so a lot of you know Phyllis Bazanson, she's got paintings all over town. And um, I went to art school, I studied, um, landscape photography. So I was always taking pictures of nature, out in nature. I, I wanted to be an Ansel Adams. Um, went back to school for horticulture and kind of uh, shifted my careers and um, have a background in municipal forestry. So I was the arborist for the city of Virginia Beach. I was an assistant city arborist. And I've been um, consulting and now I teach um, arboriculture and community forest management at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture at UMass. So to make a long story short, I've been on both sides of the aisle. I have represented a town in the city and responsible for that city's trees and the people. And I have been on the consultant end um, representing um, homeowners with a disagreement with a town or a city um, based on uh, related to trees. And I can tell you, it's not fun to go to court um, over trees. And you would think trees aren't political, but sometimes they end up being that way or- We're well aware. No, yeah. Well aware. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, it's not, so I guess, I, so I'd love to see people avoid those yeah. types of situations if they can. And uh, when I became the city arborist in Virginia Beach, it was uh, you know a, a position that was kind of handed to me. And the city was a little bigger than Southboro, it was 358 square miles, over half a million residents. And I, you know, and I had a certain budget and they're like, okay, now go take care of the trees. I'm like, well, how many trees do we have? Oh, we don't know. <laughs> well, what condition are the trees in? Well, we don't know. So, the, you know, the, regardless of the scale of your town or your city, you have to know what your assets are and how valuable they are in order to protect them and care for them. And the difference between trees and maybe, um, you know, other municipal aspects like um, trucks and buildings. Um, as trees grow older, they usually appreciate in age because their benefits become greater. However, they're living things and they need to have care. Um, so let's go to the next slide if we can. All right. And so, yeah, the topic, yeah, the topics, these are, um, so we're going to talk about the benefits of the urban forest. Um, 
kind of common practices. And this is something that as a professor, as a consultant, as even a city arborist, always um, trying to work with developers and contractors and, and city leaders on what really are the um, common tree practices. Because again, we do have the luxury of the internet, but someone could read something on the internet, what to do with the tree, like pour vinegar on it and it'll be fine. Like, no, 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 we don't do that. We actually have tree care standards. So there's a lot of myths that um, are still out there it, because you saw it on uh, Pinterest doesn't make it real, okay? And then uh, what is an arborist, a tree warden, a forester? It depends on what state you live in sometimes. And then a little bit of chapter, Mass General Law chapter 87. All right, next picture. So yeah, go, think the, the word urban forest. So here we are in a town and a lot of people think of the word urban forest. They might be thinking of a big city, um, but urban forestry is really uh, the practice of caring for trees where people work, live and play. And urban forestry goes back in New England, way back to um, 1646, when it was Bay Colony times, trees were being removed left and right. Because don't forget, trees were being harvested from the New World to send back to England because that's how you made your strong navy. You had, your ships were how strong of a, a government you were. So we had, the biggest trees over here that weren't taken yet. And so they were, they came here, clear cut most everything into logging. George Washington made all of his money because he had um, drained swamps and cut down trees all over. Um, but in 1646, they, they established tree-lined streets from Boston to Roxbury already back in the day because they wanted to have the shade. They wanted, you know, and they recognized that if they kept cutting the trees at the progress they were going, they weren't going to have any more left. Um, so, so again, urban forestry is a combination of um, environmental conservation, public works, horticulture, tree science, and a lot of uh, social and economic um, factors all kind of combined together. All right, next slide. So yeah, the earth, so again, when you say the urban forest, people are always worried, well, does that mean private property trees or public trees or where do you draw the boundary? If we're looking at South Borough from overhead and we're looking straight down and we're looking at the tree canopy covering the whole town, that is all encompassing of the urban forest. So trees on private property and the town all do combine and make up um, the benefits because again, trees don't know boundaries and trees in groups are, are doing all of the benefits of supplying oxygen, sequestering carbon, um, and, and they're really assets to the, the whole town. Now, what we can do on private property and town property does differ. So, um, but generally the trees in the public right of way um, are the trees that a town is responsible for. And again, if you look at a big picture, looking straight down at most towns in Massachusetts, 80% of the town's trees are on private property and only about 20% of the town's trees on, are on that municipal or the, the public property. And sometimes you can hear um, the word urban and community forestry <clears throat> interchangeable. And the reason that sometimes community forestry is used is it's more um, encompassing. So if it is suburban or rural, the community forests makes more sense. Again, where I live way out in the hill towns, when you say urban forest, it, doesn't really ring a bell as much as a community forest might. Okay, next slide. And again, we can go on and on and on about the benefits of urban forestry. Um, uh, the former boss I had when I worked for the city of Chesapeake was a, a Marine. And if anyone ever um, 
lives with a Marine or works with a Marine or knows a Marine, they use acronyms for everything. So he um, taught me safer to understand the benefits of the urban forest. And so social, aesthetic, functional, economical, and recreational, often trees are places where people gather. You know, New England especially, we are known for the town common. And in the town common, you have your beautiful trees, you have your memorials. Town common is where people gather. They're outside, you feel really good. Uh, um, aesthetically, a lot of trees were often planted for beautification projects. Um, and uh, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. Uh, nowadays, we're looking at places in Boston and unfortunately there are places where trees were planted only in wealthy neighborhoods and not in um, other neighborhoods. And now they're suffering from more heat and pollution and um, kind of the, the, the bad effects of, of that. Uh, functional trees, again, are providing so much um, heating and cooling to buildings. So if they're properly placed around the landscaping, generally on the Western side, a deciduous tree is gonna keep that um, afternoon sun from beating down on a house. But then in the winter, when it loses its leaves, it'll still let the sunlight through. Um, trees are sequestering carbon, um, absorbing particulate matter. So dust particles, uh, so many, many things. Economical, um, again, um, good, good landscaping, um, well cared for landscaping adds a lot of value to your home. They've done studies where even like uh, just some really nice landscaping can almost increase your home's value 30 to 40% as opposed to redoing a bathroom, okay? Um, the um, uh, businesses that have trees uh, outside, especially outdoor cafes, people will pay more for the goods and services they receive in those cafes, and then they generally will want to stay more. Now, in times of uh, pandemic living, we all love to go to outdoor cafes, and who wants to sit in a parking lot without any umbrellas or trees and have dinner? You know, people want to be out there with a shady. And then the re recreational. So people also want to be fishing and hunting and going out into the woods and mountain biking and doing all the wonderful things. And that's usually involved around trees. So again, just on and on and on. And you can find all kinds of um, studies about the benefits of the urban forest. Okay. So we know how valuable the urban forest is and all these wonderful things that um, they provide for us. Again, if they're well cared for. And so there's a lot of confusion about um, in Massachusetts, what's an arborist, a tree <clears throat> warden, or a forester? And I, unfortunately, there are so many different associations and it is confusing. Um, the photo on the left are uh, commercial tree care people. So that is someone who, you know, you would call and the arborist would come onto your property or, and, um, you know, do tree removal or tree pruning, maybe plant trees, and that's for hire. So that, that's sort of your commercial arborist. And then we go all the way to uh, sometimes people working in cities and towns are your urban foresters. Uh, some, a lot of times it's volunteer a lot of volunteer people. Um, the arborist in Massachusetts, um, really there isn't much of a definition. So if you wanted to start a business, you come in here and show your driver's license and pay whatever fee and you can have a tree company. Unlike uh, Connecticut, you have to be a licensed arborist. You have to show proof that you have had training and that you have passed the Connecticut arborist um, training before you can open up a business in Connecticut. Again, a tree warden is appointed by the town or the city. And a forester is often someone who will only look at a, a section of trees that's 20 acres and greater, okay? Again, it's, it's, it's very confusing. There's a lot of credentials. But all of these credentials are voluntary in Massachusetts. But 
the thing that makes it different is if somebody is working under a contract. So many towns and cities require to have Arbor certification or credentials to work on a project, and especially if it might be a road project. So these are the credentials that you would look for in Massachusetts. We have the Mass Certified Arbors, otherwise known as MCA. We also have the Massachusetts Qualified Tree Warden, and that's more of a, uh, um, a credential, like a um, qualification, more than it is a certification. It's just a one-time training. The Mass Arborist and the International Society of Arboriculture, the one over here on the right, both require you to continually add um, CEUs in, in education and keep up your membership and your trainings. But there's um, a vast amount of them and every little um, different one has a different expertise. And there's also the Tree Care Industry Association uh, safety person because tree care is, can, can, can be dangerous. So you want to make sure when you are having it done at your home or with the town that the person really understands the equipment they're using, the risks involved, and that they're fully um, not just licensed and insured, but they understand the, the project. All right, Colleen, next slide. So again, some of we, we do have a lot of um, industry standards. So that's something that if the people are certified arborists, they usually have to follow these industry standards and there's ethics. Industry standards include the safety of all of our equipment when we're climbing trees and pruning trees. And also the industry standards go to tree preservation, especially around construction. And with Massachusetts right now, we're seeing a lot of towns getting grants to widen the streets and do complete streets and have more bike lanes and sidewalks put in. But when that happens, we're running into um, existing street trees. To, so to have um, really good tree preservation um, that really works. Um, this is a great picture right here. This is uh, in the town or the city of Northampton. And Typically when you see tree protection, it's just orange snow fencing, a little plastic fencing. And that really doesn't do much to, to protect a tree. A chain link fence really means business. It's got a sign on explaining what it is. So um, again, that's just something out of our industry standard. Okay. So again, here's just a, uh, you know, we're not gonna go over all of them, but just there's 10 different standards. So, and they're all in, all of the different aspects of tree care from you know, managing the soils all the way to pruning to um, what you might be interested in in South Borough is integrated vegetation management. That's something that the utility companies will be following. And so that's removing not just the uh, trees and the branches, but anything that's growing with that would interfere with that utility, whether it be electricity or gas or um, coax cable or anything, um, you know, utility companies have to have um, reliable electricity. They, they can be fined up to a million dollars a day if there's a, um, um, a tree outage that was, you know, caused from a line. So they, they have to be really careful. And a lot of this is federal regulations and it's tied to Homeland Security. So the way that they do integrated vegetation management is a whole different thing. You know, they use, sometimes they use a little bit of herbicide, sometimes they use mechanical control, and other times they're using, um, um, you know, goats, sheep. <laughs> there could be a lot of different ways. So it, it's, it's really interesting. Okay, next one. And then again, really, I can't hone in enough how much a certified arborist and um, people who are, who are trained and, and work for companies who are really, um, embracing the safety standard, um, abide by this uh, Z133. And these are things that different towns and cities have written into their bylaws and their contracts at least. So if they're working with a contractor, they wanna make sure that that contractor knows what this is. If you're working with a tree contractor and they've never heard of this, that would be um, concerning. Okay, next slide. So again, the. This, this was developed because um, early 70s, a, um, a young 18 year old boy um, was killed the first day on the job. And the mom's like, well, did you train, train him? Like what happened? And, and there was no training. They just assumed, you know, 
come on, work for us. We'll give you a chainsaw and you can, you know, use a chipper and, but not everyone knows how to do that. So that's kind of the, a little bit of background, but they're updated every uh, two to five years and they're peer reviewed and they go a lot on statistics. And unfortunately right now in New England, we have had a lot of deaths recently, um, you know, again, throughout all of the New England states in the tree care industry. And it doesn't necessarily mean it was someone who is a trained arborist, but because they classify landscapers as arborists and tree trimmers all into one category. But there have been, it, it is a very dangerous um, profession and we do have a lot of uh, dangerous trees around. So next slide. So getting into um, Mass General Law Chapter 87, again, here's a tree warden directing his volunteers on proper tree planting methods. So, you know, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, you know, a little higher, low, but they're measuring and get, it's getting that tree set in the hole just right before they backfill it with soil and making sure that he's kind of overseeing, you know, basically the quality and control of what's happening in this town. And I do have a copy of this, the guide of the local bylaws. Everyone who's online can find it. Um, you can just go to the DCR urban um, and community forestry webpage and you can find it. Colleen has four packets for you um, tonight. I didn't have any more than four hard copies, but this has a lot of really good information and it has samples of other towns and other cities in Massachusetts and little um, chunks of what bylaws that they have in their town related to different aspects, okay? So again, you know, the, the chapter 87 is known as the shade tree law. And it really has to do with when someone wants to remove or prune a, a shade tree. And if that tree is, you know, there's a lot of trees that you can't really always tell is it is it in this, the town's right of way or is it on private property or is it right on the line? Generally, they assume if it's sort of a, a tree that's right on the line, most of the time they're considering it a town tree. Um, again, if you think of the canopy that's gonna, as the tree grows, it's gonna go over the street and shade the street as well as it's gonna shade the house. So having a policy of, of how we decide who gives permission to do what to the tree, um, that's established through chapter 87. But chapter 87 also allows the town or the municipality to come up with their own regulations. So you, you, can, you can have bylaws, you can strengthen your bylaws, but you can also put in some regulations. So you know, the thing with the bylaw is it often takes a long time and then it's almost impossible to change it. But sometimes if you have a regulation, that's something you, you might be able to, to work with and have a little bit of wiggle room. Okay, next slide. So again, no street tree can be pruned or removed without a public hearing. But again, there's exceptions for high risk trees. And that's, that is, in my opinion, a very good thing because let's say you have a storm that blew through and there's some trees hanging over an intersection, you don't wanna to have to close the intersection for four days and wait till the next Tuesday to have a hearing to see if it's okay to cut that tree down and the intersection blocked, you know? So trees that are dead, trees that are diseased, trees that have an, uh, like a known uh, nuisance, whether it's an insect or um, um, some other type of thing that can spread, um, but those generally fall into that category. And again, um, the hearing is open so citizens can come and then there are violations and fines for people who violate um, the tree policy, okay? Um, there are, generally, there's three, now ordinances is interchangeable with the word bylaw. Basically, if you are a city, you have an ordinance. If you're a town, we have a bylaw. So, um, <coughs> Bylaws for trees in a lot of urban forest management plans or in a lot of um, street tree plans have three to four types of ordinances. So that street tree, that real that tree that's going down the middle of the road or the trees along the sidewalks, 
Then there's also tree protection or tree preservation ordinances. These are, um, if you had maybe a, a, a memorial tree or a special tree that, you, um, that has some type of legacy to it, or the town has decided every tree that is a um, pecan tree you know, uh, is, a, is a special tree in South Borough or something. It would be because they don't really grow here. So, um, so again, would, did you, do you want to have a special protection for pecan <clears throat> trees or do you want to have a special protection for trees of a certain age or trees for a certain size? Again, that's up to the town. And then view ordinances, not so much here in Massachusetts, but in California, there's a lot of view ordinances. So if you're living near the water and your neighbor plants a row of arborvitaes because they don't want to see you, they're trying to screen you, but now you lost your million dollar view and you cut the top of their arborvitaes off. Can they sue you? Can you sue them? Those type of rules apply. And the other thing now between view ordinances, they're more related to solar energy. So if, so if your neighbor comes in and puts in solar, but then you, you know asks you to cut all your trees down because they now have solar, you know, what are what is the town's opinion or decisions going to be on that? And there's one ordinance or bylaw that's not up here, and it's called landscape bylaws. And so if a business was coming in and they were um, you know, going to put in a parking lot and they, um, however the, the business is gonna look, not only do you worry about their signs, the entrance, the exits, but you also worry about what type of landscaping will they be providing. Okay, next. So again, the 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 day-to-day -day things often in a town that people have to manage with trees is the, the risk that trees provide. Yes, we have all of the wonderful things, um, the benefits of urban forcing and healthy, well cared for trees. Trees are living things, they die, they get old, um, storms come in, we get um, unknown invasive species, we get um, environmental aspects. Um, so oftentimes the trees will pose some type of a risk and, and depending on where the tree is located, the risk may be greater than um, if the tree is in a place where there's not a lot of people or property for it to um, fall down. Because when a tree is dead, it falls down. Next slide, please. So again, we, we think of risk. So the combination of the likelihood of an event and what is the severity of the potential consequences. So that's the level of risk the town needs to decide, you know, what do they want, want to live with? And generally when you get that, you 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 would have a tree inventory. So you would get a, an idea of what, um, how many trees you have in the town, what condition are they in? And then you can prioritize your risk. So we have hundred dead trees, okay? Generally a dead tree, most people put it at the, at the top of their um, list. Then we have, um, you know, 40 trees that are only half dead. <laughs> um, and then maybe 30 trees that just look weird. They're not dead, they just look funny. So you could kind of uh, try to prioritize those things. But in, in a case like this, um, you know, the risks here would be the risks to the energized electricity. There'd be risks to the right of way underneath. There'd be, uh, I see footprints where someone was walking. So the risk would be to people walking in the street. The risk is also to the landscaping. The historic stone walls that Southboro has are, are beautiful. So, you know, there'd be a little um, risk to that. So you weigh the risks, um, but someone would look at this tree and go, oh, it kind of looks funny. It's perfectly healthy. It was just kind of pruned weird because to allow for the electricity to, to go through. Um, but again, having someone, you know, looking at, understand the risks and um, being able to present that to the town would be really, really helpful. Next. So yeah, the, the risk management is having, again, a kind of a systematic approach to looking at your trees and identifying what those risks are posing and what, what would happen if something, if 
we didn't mitigate this. So often you could say, okay, well, this tree has a dead limb um, and the limb is over the sidewalk. Well, if you prune that limb off, you've completely lowered that risk. So that, that tree still, you know, if you can't get rid of 100% of the risk, but you can lower it. So you could say, all right, we've sort of narrowed the risk down and, you know, unless it gets another dead limb, it's not that bad anymore. But the, the one thing that is, you need the, the trained um, tree risk assessor to look at a tree. Trees can be tricky. They can be full of foliage and green and lush and appear very healthy, but structurally they're very dangerous and they could, um, you know, they, they could be put together like a toothpick <laughs> and they just need a 40 mile an hour gust to, 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 to um, fall over. And again, it's hard to look at a tree and think it's healthy and make it mean that it's at low risk, that always is not the same, all right? And again, this is not Southboro, this is a town right next to Southboro and you can drive all around Worcester County and anywhere in Massachusetts. And this is typical of what we are seeing. We've had really harsh, uh, warming. We've had several droughts. I think the last um, night, uh, was it 2017, 18, and 19, those were three years of back-to-back -back droughts. Then there was the attack of the spongy moth and the winter moth, so the trees were stressed out, and the, the, because they didn't get water, then the bugs came along, and they just couldn't take it. So there's there's dead standing trees all over. And then the, the, the two species that we're having trouble with are oak trees and ash trees. The emerald ash borer is now alive and well and all over um, Worcester County and um, just eating trees faster than people can care for them. And a lot of these, you can't treat for them. And certainly, I mean, these are dead, dead. So there's, there's no, they're not gonna turn green next spring. Okay, next slide. So where do you start? Okay, um, when you do an urban forest management plan, you it can be as large as you want it or a small document. You could have it be something for a 20 year period of time. A lot of people do it for 10 years. Um, you, you wanna have the resource of the trees quantified, whether that is a sample inventory, a complete inventory, a canopy analysis, there's different ways to go about it. You wanna have a, a management plan to manage those trees. And then you want really, really good communication where all of the stakeholders involved. So you want your um, tree wardens, your city departments, the public, the contractors, um, anybody doing business in town, um, visitors, tourists, everybody to understand, you know, how important South Wales trees are. And I know you are a Tree City USA, so you're already communicating um, that to the public. So all of these things kind of overlap and go with each other. All right, next slide. So again, you've already, you, you've got some brand new streets and new sidewalks. Um, in, in the center of town, you have to, again, get a good picture of what's going on in Southboro. What is a picture of our trees right now? Do our trees look like the two slides back where we have a whole bunch of dead trees? Or do we have a, a bunch of new, brand new planted trees? What is the age? Like are all of our trees down our streets all 150 years old? Do we have any young trees? Are all of our trees one species? So if we get another, um, you know, beetle or something that comes along, is it just going to go from tree to tree to tree? Or do we have a biodiversity of different trees? Okay, next slide. Again, and then what is it that the, what is it that the town wants? What do you want to see? What is the future for Southboro? Um, are you know? More and more people are living in, in cities. It's going to get crowded. Um, and 
to make Southboro a nice place to live. Again, we want to have the benefits of these trees. This is a town similar in size of Southboro, and it also has two really um, prestigious um, pub, uh, private schools uh, in it. And um, this is the town of Deerfield. And there's a nice, you know, you can go through the, the town's main street and you can see beautiful shade trees and both the, the private schools and the public streets kind of care for the landscape kind of equally. And it's really quite lovely. And they, they have a lot of tourism in this um, area. And again, a lot of people are seeking this town for its um, private schools. Okay, next picture. So again, how, how is the town gonna to decide where it wants to go? There's a lot of different options. Um, some towns will form a tree commission or a tree committee, or even just maybe um, a tree work group if you don't wanna have another committee. There's a lot of towns that have very active citizens and very philanthropic people in the town that decide they wanna to put together a nonprofit. And then that nonprofit can kind of work really closely with the town. And so the nonprofit can say, look, we know you have to cut down lots of trees and you're probably gonna run out of money to plant trees. So, you know, let us be the, the people to help you decide what trees to plant. And that's going on in a lot of different towns. People are um, getting youth involved, they're getting retired people involved and, and they're out there as like citizen scientists helping do tree inventories and, and helping um, to, to assess where we wanna plant trees and where we wanna go. You can hire consultants. So you can hire a company to come in and do your inventory, like do the whole thing, or you can just have someone come in and say, you know, kind of help you with the planning process. Um, or you could uh, maybe share the planning with another town. You know, uh, I think a couple months ago, I saw an ad for Hopkinton, or maybe it was Westboro looking for a tree warden or, um, but you know, they're about the same size towns and we share borders. So maybe you can do planning with some of the other towns. Um, let's go next slide. So again, you gotta know what your assets are. How, you know, how can we take care of our trees if we don't know how many they are and what condition there are? Okay, next slide. So again, often the um, street tree plan would be to quantify. Looking at Southboro, how do you decide where we start? Or how do we decide, are we gonna do sample inventories or full inventory? Again, with, with you know, well, there's a lot of trees there. Um, the city that I, I had to do a tree inventory, we actually broke it up by watershed because trees are very closely related to clean water and you have a lot more um, stricter, uh, rules generally around wetlands. So you could, you know, you could break up Southboro by watershed. You could break it up by um, by town. You could, I mean, by the um, the different, you know, bills. Um, but there's, you, you don't have to necessarily do the whole town, and you don't have to do it all at once. But or you could do it just from above ground, the tree canopy. Again, these are just uh, different ways to um, look at it. But each time you're doing it, you're, you're, evaluate, you're evaluating it and you're setting goals. Okay, next slide. Again, a tree inventory could be as simple as a, a windshield. You're driving down the road. You're getting maybe a count of your tree, but you may not necessarily get up close to know is that tree hollow <clears throat> or rotted inside, even though it's all green, um, or does it have an insect infestation and things like that. Um, Next slide. And again, once you once you have your inventory or your idea of what you do, then you're going to come up with your management plan. And so a lot of that can be reviewing what codes and a lot of these things can be going on simultaneously. Like while you're waiting for your tree inventory, you can be having people like, let's look, how old are our bylaws? Do they go back to 1646? <laughs> Are, are where they go back to the 70s or are they are they really out of date or are they good if they're good um, or should we create some um, guidelines or some um, other things besides an ordinance you know again uh, 
fines. The fines that we have if someone violates um, one of our bylaws was the fine written in 1646. So it's like 50 cents to, to do something or would you want to be up to current times? I don't know if anyone's gone to a nursery lately to buy a, a large caliber tree, but it's not, it's more than a, you know, a couple hundred dollars to, to buy a tree, plant it and get it established. Um, and again, staff, like who's making the decisions, you know, or is there training that needs to be done for people? Um, can we help them? Can one, can we have one person doing a couple of different things or can we have it in different departments? So things like that. Okay, next. And again, you guys remember Snowmageddon? It wasn't that long ago. Um, what happened, you know, because we have many, many more trees and we have a lot of people, We've been pretty lucky not to have a horrible ice storm or a nor'easter or another blizzard of 78 or the snowmageddon. Um, but, you know, there's got to be plans for when we have a lot of uh, tree debris and, and interruption of services. And what do you do with all that debris? Some towns have um, tree wood banks, so they're recycling the wood or giving the wood away. Um, this year, there's gonna be a lot of people who are having a hard time paying their heating bills. So, you know, does it, the town has excess wood, you know, can it be in a wood bank? Um, you know, what are we gonna do? Are you, you know, are you gonna call in contractors? Do you already have contractors in place? Um, because a lot of these storms that we're having now are getting their, we get shorter notice and they're more intense storms. So it's, so it's sort of hard to do something after the fact. Right, you want you want to have that stuff set in place, and again, you could share it with other towns, uh, things like that. But that's something to think about. Uh, next slide. Again, there's all kinds of ways to help you out here. My favorite thing right now is the Vibrant Cities Lab. It's a website, and it has all kinds. You can fall down the rabbit hole of information on, you know, again, you're assessing assessing what you have, you're prioritizing, you're organizing, you're doing your plan, you're protecting it, you're sustaining it. They have scenarios, they have, um, um, you know, little um, towns and cities that um, have all kinds of examples to show you. It's, and it's free and it's fun to use and it's a great tooling kit. UMass, we have this guideline you can download. It's a PDF, it's Planting for Resilience. So it has a lot of um, trees that were selected for the future, right? So the trees that might be able to withstand the hotter temperatures that we're getting. Um, what, what trees do you plant when we have a lot of salt on the road because winter and ice? What trees are appropriate for planting under wires uh, so that you don't want the trees to be over pruned? So that's another free good guidebook for you to look at. Okay, next slide. Again, this is the, the community part, the, the person part. So um, again, what have, has anyone done a survey with the town? Um, you know, what does the town see? Sometimes people use the, the photos of a tree line street or a street without trees, or, you know, what do people want? Do they want um, more shade trees at some parks, at schools? Do they want street trees in their neighborhood? There's a lot of people who don't like trees and don't want trees. And so what's going on with that? Or do they not like the trees because the trees are interfering with their day-to-day -day aspects? Um, uh, when I was a city arborist, we got a lot of calls from people who had uh, Winnebago's and campers and you know they drive down their little cul-de-sac, but basically the, the gigantic Winnebago was pruning every tree down the street. So like, they're like, you gotta prune these trees. And again, you have clearance for fire trucks and you know big garbage trucks to come by a little narrow street those, you know, those trees need to be cared for. But again, you have a lot of wonderful groups in Southford who obviously care for trees and nature and want more. And so how can all of these groups get together and kind of work together for Southboro's uh, future? Next slide. Again, um, communication has to be through all aspects. Uh, when I worked for the, the, the big city, um, there were so many different departments. It was like, it was huge. And we, you know, some city, some departments had ordinances that conflicted with another ordinance. 
So you, it was very confusing for someone to do business or a homeowner like, well, I'm trying to go by this law, but this law says this, and what am I supposed to do? So make sure you're communicating inner city departments, you're communicating with your, your, um, your nonprofits, you're communicating with business, your schools, um, everybody in town. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really, really important for everyone to understand what's, what's going on. And so you have, maybe you have like a little um, section on your website that's just about trees and can, people can go there and find out all the information they want. Next slide. So again, what, this is out of a public works document. Again, uh, some people have an actual urban forest division or, you know, the, um, it could, maybe it's three people, but it doesn't always have to be in the Department of Public Works. Some are operating out of um, parks and rec. Some folks have an arborist or a tree warden in the planning department. And again, again, just the different, um, professionals that are brisk, a tree warden or a horticulturist are depending again, what comes out of that plan? What does the, the town want to see? Um, next slide. And again, uh, specifications come out of those documents that I um, had earlier, where we have all of those guidelines, you know, those are our industry standards when you're having uh, specifications to do work. Everybody should understand. Yes, you're cutting down this tree, not that tree. Um, I can't tell you how many times when a contractor may come onto a property and they cut down the wrong tree or they prune the wrong thing, you can't put it back. So um, make sure everyone understands what's going on. This is uh, working on a graveyard, so you can't like drive a truck over the grass or you're gonna ruin the, you know, in the historic grave. So everybody's gotta know what's not just above ground, but what's below ground too. Next slide. Again, um, South Borough is just absolutely gorgeous and scenic. And, um, you know, these trees were here when I was a kid, you know, 100 years ago. And hopefully they're going to be there when I'm, you know, 200 years old. And, um, but yeah, it's just how, how do you want to, to um, keep South Borough, um, you know, safe and clean and beautiful and, um, and moving on? You know, these trees, again, they're kind of, uh, elderly, I don't see a lot of um, young trees being planted. And so sometimes it's good to like plan ahead, like, because we know these are going to come down eventually. Well, let's go ahead and get a few established in the next few years. So when these do come down, it's not going to just be bare. Next slide. Because again, um, we are in a town with a lot of cul-de-sacs and you can, you can imagine that in the next few years, you could get more and more and more. And you know, can you imagine living in a community without trees? You know, do you really want to um, have software look like this in the future? Okay, next slide. And that's it. So um, there's some of my contact information. I've got these packets for um, I've only got four for the planning board but I'm very happy to take any questions anyone has and please email me or contact me in the future. Um, but there's a lot of people that would be able to um, help you, including students that need to do tree inventories for homework projects, things like that. Any questions? Thank you very much, that was Fabulous. Right. Encouraging because we're starting. So we have a, a bylaw that's coming before town meeting in October. We're, there is inventory on some streets, so we've started doing that. There's communication with other yeah. departments. We're trying to set, you know, a policy that everybody understands. So we're I think we're, you know, headed in the right direction, which is very encouraging. There are a lot of wheels spinning at the same time, and yeah. it's, it's hard to start from scratch. But if you can kind of, you know, yeah. combine some of those things, and again, hopefully those um, that packet from DCR. I know they would love to come out and help you out. There are grants that the town can apply to that helps you um, design a plan. There are grants you can have to help you do a tree inventory or some other projects. So um, there's usually funding available that's really not too hard to obtain. 
um, to just get on the email list for DCR and we should know when the new grants come out. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, much appreciated. Um, do you find that most towns, is it a full-time position that someone has to maintain the trees? Or Generally, the size of the town, you know, if it's, I, I, mean, I have 3,000 people in my town and we don't really have a full-time tree warden. Um, the towns that are larger and the community members are um, demanding trees, yes, sir. They will have a full-time person because they're the community is asking for it. Yeah. They want trees to look lush. They want la other landscaping. They want you know mowing of the 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 um the right of ways. They want you know the schools to be pristine. So that that expert isn't just you know cutting down the trees and, and plowing. They might be doing gardens as well or um, you know, shrubs or you know, adding things at schools or, or doing different things. Well, thank you. This is great um, and perfect timing. Yeah. The recommendation. But yeah, but a, a lot of people also will hire a contractor, you know, to if they would have someone maybe overseeing it, but then that contractor could come in and help, you know, do some of them. Right, and then we, we just need a plan that they need to stick to. Right. Well, that's why the specifications I wanted people to be aware of, like, you know, just don't call. Um, Joe. Yeah, look, <laughs> if, if it's if they, you know, again, this is a, a, a great state, people can do what they want, but, it, you know, pressure washing um, your driveway, cleaning the gutters and cutting your trees. It, it kind of, it, you know, do they have the credentials to take a crane over your house? Do they have the credentials to understand tree biology? And like, if you're really wanting to preserve these trees and keep them along safer, do they know how to properly mulch a tree and things, things like that, that maybe the trained arborist, again, so it's writing those specifications. So when you send out something for bid, you're not gonna necessarily get someone that might damage your trees because um, they weren't trained okay. proper pruning. Mr. Stein, do you have any questions? Hey, Christina. Um, I actually went to UMass Amherst and uh, graduated in 95, and I really loved it out there. Uh, so I certainly appreciate uh, the bucolic setting of the Happy Valley. Um, and I uh, really appreciate your presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, I do have a question about utilities. In your experience, how have you seen towns work with utilities? You know, so for example, um, you know, on a, on a protected tree by the bylaw, we would have a public hearing uh, before like our own DPW were to remove it. Um, do you see that the towns generally have that same level of protection and enforcement when it comes to, you know, electrical infrastructure? It's, it's really important for your tree warden to, uh, to um, have the cell phone number of the forester. I don't know if you have Eversource or National Grid or National both. Grid. National Grid. So National yeah, Grid would have a, their a urban forester or utility forester. That's probably spread across the whole, you know, metro region. So they may not, you know, come through Southboro that often. But if the, if you're, Tree Warden has a good relationship with that urban forester for that utility. You know, again, you would they would meet with them. They would say, look, this is a particular tree we want to keep around as long as possible. Or, hey, this tree looks like it's right next to your transformer. Can you get can you take care of it for us? And often sometimes the if it's um, again negotiable, maybe they can do some of the contracting, but they leave the wood and then it's the town's responsibility to like, okay, well, we can get the tree away from the electricity and not make it, you know, harm, but then it's your job to like, you know, dispose of the rest of the wood. Um, or, hey, uh, you just came and got, you know, 75 trees removed. Is there any way that you have any donations to the town to plant some new trees that you will prove 
to be planted on the alliance. And they love to work with towns to for your future plan because you know they don't want to come and spend money pruning those trees. So if they're if you're planting trees that aren't going to require a lot of maintenance, maybe they can help you uh, find funding for planting and things like that. So again, it's just really getting a relationship with that whoever that urban forester is for that utility. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see what then. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much. I think the, the resources, the, a lot of the like build your own tools, I think they'll be helpful in the coming months for us as we move this warrant article forward. But I think this is hugely educational. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes, it's a, a very overwhelming, but then reach out to me. I think just the, the packet information, if you start with that, it, it might help out. And other tree wardens of other towns will be happy to talk to you. And, you know, especially if they went through a planning process or, or call DCR and say, who, who has one of the best uh, new bylaws you like, or you, you know, think is working well, um, you, you can do that. But it's, but it's good to find a town that has the same resources that South Pro does, right? Again, I, I think I shared the city of Cambridge with Debbie, but the city of Cambridge has different resources than you do. And again, a much different infrastructure and way more staff, but so that's kind of hard to compare, but find another town about the same size um, and, and find out, you know, what's good, working good or, or not. So. Thanks, thank you very much. I think it's Sure. You want it in the public? Mimi, I have a quick question for um, Christina. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks, Christina. It's really very informative. And you know, you know what else is very motivating? The, the um, presentation you did hits on all the right points that helps you realize that this can be done. Um, yes, it just takes some, you know, perseverance. So the one question I have is about tree inventories. Um, do these tree inventories just include public shade trees? Or when you say tree inventory, does it mean all trees in the town? Excellent question. So if you did the urban tree canopy analysis, that's just looking at the trees from above that includes everything. But generally, the street tree analysis would be trees that are impacting the right of way. So there may be a private tree, but if it's leaning and all of the branches are overhanging the right of way, in Massachusetts, there's an invisible line of the property that goes straight up. So often trees are on one property, but if anything that's on that side, legally you can, you know, you can get, it's not good for the tree, but it gets pruned where that property line is. And so that's the same with between two private residences. If someone goes on to that other side, then you're trespassing. So you got to be careful of that. But um, you decide what you want to do for your tree inventory. So if you're not interested in the trees on private property, then you don't have to include that. Um, so that's something whoever's conducting your inventory. I think if, if the trees are, are somehow impacting the right of way. So if it's dead, dying, or diseased, that might be something to note. Um, maybe if it's um, you know invasive species, that might be something to note. The other thing with a tree inventory is you can also add on tree risk to it. It takes a little longer, but if someone's out there looking at every single one of your trees, you can also have them perform a, a risk assessment at the same time. So they're not just saying, the age, the size, the condition of this tree, but they're saying, yeah, this is a high risk tree, a medium risk or a low risk tree. Okay, and if you have um, town property, like a community center or any property that's owned by the town, the schools, that would all be included. That's right, that's all your, that's all 100% town property trees. And Gravy, I, I assume most of the graveyards are owned by the town. Yeah, so graveyards are another example, but again, lower risk because not as many people are maybe at a graveyard as they would be a school. A school to me would be 
that's a higher priority to look at. Do they include easements where the town has an easement to pass on? So an easement, that can be, that's depending what the easement is. Uh, the easement is particularly written for that, whatever that purpose is. So the easement might just be, um, someone has the right to just walk across my backyard to get to the soccer field. Uh, the easement could be a utility easement. So it could mean it's a gas line or a, a, ut or a overhead power line, a transmission line. And that means the utility company has the right to come along and maintain that easement. So the easement is, it really matters to what the easement is about. Okay, it's, thank you. It's not, it's not just yes or no. Okay. <laughs> But, but the, yeah, the right of way is the, is the really the ones that the town needs to pay attention to maintaining. Um, and again, the, the cost of not maintaining something can sometimes bankrupt a town too. If there was an injury or property damage that was, um, you know, found to be neglect, like, because the tree had been dead for years and nobody did anything about it. Um, that could be very costly. So anyone in Zoom land with their hands up? There's currently 15 attendees and no hands raised. One more question. Yeah. Um, so some towns impose fees in addition to fines. And typically they're on, they'll set some sort of, um, I see that they maybe say, okay, any tree that's taken down um that's great in the public way that's greater than three feet diameter or some whatever they said as part of their plan um and some of these fees are really really high yeah. tens of thousands of dollars thousand dollars or an inch over fifty, something like that i'm just wondering if you can speak to to you know is, is that a good deterrent is that are a lot of towns doing that or uh, so the towns that have those um generally the the large fees that are that comes from the um there's a, a group called ASCA, the um, American um, Consulting Arborists Association. <clears throat> and in California and Boston and places that are very highly valued landscaping, um, like where people pay millions of dollars a month to have the landscaping maintained. Um, a, a lot of times a, a, a tree over 10 or 12 inches, you cannot go to a nursery and buy anything. Some of these trees are hundreds of years old. It's, it's, it's almost like comparing it to a, a, a very valuable one of a kind painting or an antique, you know, you can't, you cannot replace this. So that's the, the parity of the years compounded. And again, as a tree gets older, it actually appreciates. So the price grossly gets ridic sounds ridiculously high because it's not compared to just going out and buying a new tree. Because um, often the, the person whose tree was damaged or destroyed will not be alive when that tree reaches them to be that big again. So that's why co they're compensated financially. Um, but there are there again the. Examples I give you, the city of Amherst, I think it's $90 an inch is, is kind of what they're, and again, it came up with their tree board. It wasn't one person deciding $100, $500. It was a whole consensus of people. And so they, they kind of had a, a, a decision. Other um, places, maybe it is $100 or $500. Sometimes it's just per tree, you know, $500 per tree, but it's, it is a deterrent um, if somebody just like, oh, we just want to put our driveway straight this way and got to cut the tree down. Well, if they see it's going to be several thousand dollars, well, maybe we'll move the driveway a little bit to the left. And, it, and then that tree will be there for a, a little bit longer. Um, and the, yeah, the, uh, the towns that had it were, probably towns that saw a lot of development in, in a hurry 
and they just the developers were paying fifty dollars five hundred because to them that wasn't a fee that was like the cost of doing business so it did not slow them down um, so that that kind of makes makes that but Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really Thank you. I'm excited to see what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is um, 359 Turnpike Road, sign location at 68 Flag. Karina, do you want to bring us up to date? Sure. So um, a couple of weeks ago, um, we were informed that um, Jack Bartolini, and I believe he may be in the audience under the attendees, um, submitted a special permit and uh, submitted an application to the zoning board to amend a special permit and a variance for um, a sign related to, well, not for a sign, but um, a special permit that was issued back in the late 90s, I believe, um, which related to the Wendy's restaurant at 359 Turnpike. And at the time, I believe over a couple of successive um, other public hearings, uh, there was a sign on the Wendy's building there was a freestanding sign, so to speak, at on the Wendy's property. And then later there was a sign um, for Wendy's allowed further east of the property on an adjacent property, which is 68 Flag Road. And that road, that um, freestanding sign on um, 68 Flag Road, and we say 68 Flag Road because the piece of property um, is part of a common driveway that fronts on Flag Road. So this property stretches between Flag Road and Route 9, um, but it's downhill from 359 where the Wendy's was. So this sign was approved so that people coming up the street on Route 9 heading west had a chance to recognize that Wendy's existed up the hill because if you were driving normally, you didn't have enough reaction time uh, to know there's a Wendy's to make a decision to pull in there. So I believe um, that was part of the reason why this um, sign was allowed downhill from Wendy's. Um, so the special permit and variance that it was approved had a couple of conditions, uh, had five conditions, um, two of which um, Jack Bartolini is asking to modify and he can speak more to this if he needs to um, because they were conditioned specifically for the Wendy's restaurant and the sign this third sign that's the subject of tonight's planning board sign application um, was identified as being on this lot two which is 68 and the conditions indicated that um, you know the signs would be removed if Wendy's changed, or the sign would be removed if Wendy's changed, or, and but this was a long time ago. So um, the sign on lot two shall be removed upon the alteration of the signage on the Wendy's site at 359 Turnpike Road, and the sign on lot two shall be removed if a commercial business other than Wendy's restaurant operates on the Wendy's site at 359 Turnpike. So I believe um, Jack is asking the Zoning Board of Appeal to amend that decision, which was a combined special permit and variance decision. So um, as part of that, he also is, um, I believe um, Wendy's is gone or has left and there's a new restaurant there and Jack wants to update this third sign that's downhill um, to reflect Nan's instead of Wendy's. Nan's is the new restaurant. So uh, as part of the process, the code indicates that in order for a spe uh, zoning board to act on a special permit uh, on a sign, they, he needs to come to the planning board to get a report back 
to the ZBA for his public hearing at the ZBA. So essentially this is um, a review and discussion by the planning board about this sign to make sure that it fits in with the five criteria listed in that code section 174-11E2. Um, so we prepared a draft memo. Um, Jack provided uh, an image of what the proposed sign would be. It's my understanding that the sign itself will remain the same. It's the messaging on the sign that would change from Wendy's um, 800 feet um, ahead to a NAN sign. And that's what you're seeing on the screen right now, this proposed sign. And it's six by 12. Currently, I believe it's proposed six by 12. It's non-illuminated. It's going to remain non-illuminated. Um, basically just the message on the sign will change in order for the people heading west up Route 9 to have early enough notice to make a decision if they wanna to go to this restaurant before going beyond it. As you know, it's more difficult to turn around and go back. So it, it, it will help the business. Um, so I believe Jack is in the attendees. Um, Here, in the flesh. <laughs> oh, he's there in the flesh. Okay, I see him on the attendees list too. So I was curious, okay. So he's there. So that's the update on the sign. So um, he's hoping that the planning board will opine on these five criteria so that a report can be provided to the ZBA on um, ZBA's public hearing for his uh, information is on August 17th, I believe. And our next meeting is August 22nd after tonight. And again, it's um, planning board providing a report with their feedback on these five criteria. Very good. Mr. Bartolini, welcome. Thank you back after three years, I guess. <laughs> Feels a little long. Sorry. First time in my life I'm not here with Don Morris. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Seriously. to just first time in my life. Wow. That's well, a big you and I both started about the same time 40 years ago. Anyway, to, to boil this down as simply as possible, all we want to do is an existing sign. All we want to do is change this. This. That's the simplest can be. In order to do that, I have to amend a decision that was issued in 1999. The sign has been in existence for 23 years. So, um, and we're hoping that this business can benefit from the same benefit that Wendy's had. Traffic's a little fast down there. Get to the stoplight, you move the forward a little bit, you see the 850 feet, you know, and to slow down, and then you can turn. That's about it in a nutshell. And that, and so that the new sign is going to be the same. Exact same sign. Exact same sign. Just the verbiage on it is going to change. Mr. Williams. Um. Other. Uh, well, first, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Great to see you in the flesh. Um. Other than the logo itself for Nans, I think being smaller than some of the lettering for mostly vegetables and some chicken. I would actually be in favor of a logo being bigger. Uh, that's me. Um, I have no questions. I probably agree with you, but that's what they okay, say. Yeah, so I know this isn't our purview, but just reading what you submitted, my only question was um, you cite the conditions on four and five. And those are just that um, it's the sign on the lot shall be removed. And then this, um, sorry, the sign on lot two shall be removed upon alteration of the signage on the Wendy site, the 359 Turnpike Road, and the sign on lot two shall be removed if a commercial business other than the Wendy's operate. So by removing those, that's all you're asking for, and that it's our approval just to go through. Right. They're, right. I mean, the sign on 359 Turnpike, they're, they're going to keep, they've already put a new sign on. Okay. Um, and then this sign here is a directional sign. Just with the NANs and with the... Right. With what we submitted. The, the, number four actually was meant to be um, 
if they altered the sign on the windy site, they made it bigger, larger, whatever, if those zoning bylaws changed and they could get bigger, more, something else, and, and they didn't need this 850 feet. But that never happened. Mr. Stein? Uh, I am looking at the questionnaires, the questionnaire for the five questions, uh, which is the actual point of this agenda item. Uh, I certainly don't see anything other than yeses for my part. So I have no questions for uh, Mr. Bartolini. Thanks. Okay. I, would, um, I have the same concern that uh, Mr. Mills has because the Wendy's, it just says, Wendy's 850 feet and you're going at least 55 miles an hour down Route 9 and that's pretty much all you can take in but this mostly vegetables, some chicken and the little teeny mans I don't think is going to serve there. Well, I mean, this is on the piece of paper but the sign is 6 feet by 12 feet so I I, I will convey it to you and tell them you think it ought to be a bigger logo. Uh, Wendy's has a national recognition this sun, this, this than the doesn't. So that right. might be the difference. Yeah, but you just won't be able to read all that. That's not uh, yeah, I think the rustic be. chicken and or rustic kitchen and market piece is probably the most important thing to get across. And, and, you know, it's just, I'll tell them. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to see it be successful. <laughs> not all successful to too, believe me. <laughs> I think you will be. So should we go through the Sign scale is determined to be reasonable in relation to development scale, viewer distance, travel speed, and sign sizes on nearby structures. I would say yes. Say yes. Mr. Stein? Yes. Yes. Sign size, shape, and placement serves to define or enhance architectural elements of the building, such as columns, sill lines, cornices, and roof edges and does not reasonably, unreasonably interrupt, obscure, or hide them. I would say that that's non-applicable in this instance. I would agree. Mr. Stein? Uh, I'll go along with your sentiment on that. Agree. Okay. C. So, this, so the point that it's not on the building. But it's not, yeah, yeah it's right. not on the building, it's down the street. Well, it's not hiding anything. Yeah, the link's too far away. Yeah. Um, sign design is in harmony with other signage on the same or adjacent structures and provides reasonable continuity and mounting location and height proportions and materials. I say yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Stein? Yes. Sign materials, colors, lettering, style, illumination, and form are reasonably compatible with building design, neighborhood context, and use. I would say yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Stein? Yes. Sign size, location, design, and illumination are not judged to present a safety hazard to vehicular or pedestrian traffic and unfavorable report that the planning board shall indicate. Which of the above criteria were not met and shall state what, what modifications to the sign or signs could be made to render a favorable report? Um, this is the one thing I have a problem with because there's so much writing on the sign. I think in order to read it, it would be safety hazard, and I would suggest that there's less writing than the NANs and the rustic market are big and the other letter in this not there so people can see it when they're driving by. So you're saying it's a negative, it's a distraction? For this, for e. yes. Okay. Ah, I, I, I think it's fine. I was just trying to say that the logo is bigger at the E4, the rustic market part. Um, I agree it's compared to what it was before, but same size, sign, and everything that I don't think it's going to be distracting. Um, I just think it defeats the purpose because people can't see. You can Could you just make little. sure you talk a little bit louder so we can hear, so that um, it comes <coughs> through on the Zoom. 
Sorry. Yeah. So the size, location, design, illumination is not judged to present a safety hazard. Sign size. The size is fine, the location is fine, the design I have an issue with. <laughs> Mr. Stein? So, uh, Mimi, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, you know, if we were the marketing department, we might have, at least this, this is my interpretation of it is, does it, does it judge, are, are we judging it to present a safety hazard? My answer to that is, is definitely no. I certainly do understand what you're saying about the, the lettering and the number of words on the sign. Is that a safety hazard in my opinion? No, thanks. I um, agree with Mr. Mills and Mr. Stein. I don't see it as a state of safety hazard. Do we wanna um, just make a note that it may be better with less writing on it? I think that's a good, yeah, I agree with that. Would like to add that time. Yes. All right. We'll be fine with E and put the note. So that's four yeses and a four condition. Yeses for five. And four suggest yeses. less writing and bigger writing. Uh, there are only four of us. No, I know, but on number five yes, questions. Yes, <laughs> okay, yes. There's four. Okay. So Karina, that's actually five yeses. If I'm not mistaken. I think Debbie is recused. Debbie, Debbie recused herself. Oh, okay. Sorry, my bad. Kind Thanks. of quickly. <laughs> I thought the same thing at first. Okay. I think, I think that's that. Okay, good enough. Okay. Yeah, right, and, and the um, planning will uh, update this memo and provide it to Jack and the ZBA tomorrow or Wednesday. Yeah, my comment I'd like to make, hi, everyone, uh, like Red. Could you actually come yes. and just state your name and address for us, please? Yeah. Hi, Lincoln Mary here at 32 Play. Um, I think one of the requests was taking out item five from the live. Is that correct? No. We're just waiting. Item five was that if Wendy's changes, the sign comes down. Oh, so, um, so so what I'd recommend if that's the case is that it's just rewritten to say if Nance closes, then the sign would come down. So you guys have some leeway in the future that should something else come in there, you still have the option to get that sign down. Because if you just take out five entirely, that sign would be there forever. Well, that's exactly what I'm asking. So just I want, to change I want, the, I want the sign there to be afforded to any of my tenants that may come forward. Um, the sign's been there for 23 years. I'm hoping it's there for another 23 years with Nance. Then, um, but to the, the visibility, the speed of the traffic, all that safety issues would have to change for that sign not to be of service to, to the building on the I, I agree with you. I'm just saying if item five there is struck entirely, you lost the option to in the future ever remove that. Instead, if you keep it as written and change Wendy's to Nan's, now he can go ahead with a sign, no problem, but you still have the leeway in the future if something else comes in there to have a sign for Nan. You can leave yourself options, that's all. It so doesn't stop him from doing it, and I'm in favor of it, um, but it gives you options in the future as opposed to removing it entirely. So that would be under the um, zoning board of appeals. Okay, they do that. So yeah, okay. we just commented on the aesthetics of the, of the sign. Yeah. So they, was, they, he, uh, Mr. Bartolini is going to ask them to, I think. I'm going to ask them exactly what you guys said to to, to see about uh, mm -hmm. making it less wordy. Yeah. And bit. to have that sign not be um, permanent. Well, specific to the tenant. You want to be able to. I want to in the future. I mean, if Nans, and I, I hope they don't, because they're a pretty young company that's got a lot of involved. I think they're going to be a plus to the community. Um, but uh, in the future, if something else uh, uh, were to, to go in there, 
then I would want the opportunity to be able to use that sign for that building. So perhaps if it's if it's vacant, then that sign would come down. That's kind of my point. Oh, that yeah. I think if you leave, leave that in there and change one of these to Nans, we just have to have another meeting with whoever that next new tenant is. Yeah, but if, you, if you just remove Mr. that, Barley's trying to avoid. That's right, exactly. What I'm trying he to doesn't avoid. like he's asking so, for the. Well, uh, it's very unusual to get a variance that doesn't deal with the land. This one went with the tenant. Right. So yeah. There's an error right there. I mean, yeah. I've got three different attorneys on this thing that's saying me that doesn't have to be here. So. Could I just ask the resident to, Mimi, could I just ask the resident to state his name again? Yeah, Lincoln sure. Marion, 32 Fiber South Ma Marion? Marion, M-E-R-R-I-H-E-W. Oh, okay. And the address is 32? Left. Left. That's where I left. I hope it's still there when I get back. But Jack, you're headed it's to It's just Dorn hard Ward. to hear. You can go to Dorn right. Ward as well. So I yeah. think the point is like politically, like how this works, that whole conversation happens with the zoning board. Got so it. we don't necessarily have right. to purview to this be able is to comment your, on that. Yeah, you got it. But to his point also, the NANS is not a well-known brand. So if you want people to stop in there, if you say NANS, that means nothing to a lot of people. If you say chicken and other stuff, that's just going to get them in. It's like, I know you're talking but can about you it, read it though? Go on. We can read Wendy's. Yeah, but it's just one. Okay, then I would <laughs> recommend actually taking the logo off entirely and just read the chicken. Was it? Yeah. 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 We're not the so marketing chicken. department. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not I, I do marketing for a living. Yeah. I just want to be successful. And this is going to help. Sure I like the rest of the line. kitchen. Market. Yeah. I understand so, they have incredible fried chicken. I can't wait for it to open it. Thank you very much. It's, it's kind of a mostly vegetables and then some chicken. <laughs> they, they, like, they specialize in healthy food and then they have fried chicken. Yeah, <laughs> they deep fry it. But, yeah, they do. I mean, there's people from South Carolina who are stuff. Yeah. It's good. Thank you Thanks. very much. Right, thank you. Thanks, Jack. And the next item on the agenda is 154 Turnpike Road, site compliance, scenic road tree removal. Of which Karina, do you want to update us? Sure. Um, so at the last planning board meeting, um, Bill DePetri indicated that he would provide um, several items to us, to the planning board, to um, mitigate and help mitigate his non compliance at the site. Um, that being said, he was going to provide that prior to tonight, but he let us know that um, he needed more time. Uh, in an email, he told us that in a timely fashion, um, we were going to push him to the August 22nd, but he's out of town and won't be returning until that evening. Um, so he asked if he could be on the September 12th. Um, and in the meantime, I um, asked him to please provide us the inf information um, as promised um, as soon as possible prior to the next meeting so that we can distribute that information to the planning board for review. And I believed it was a uh, proposed landscaping plan of what he was proposing in lieu of what was a pro uh, uh, approved. Um, he was going to um, confirm if the tree, the public shade tree, if it was a public shade tree, if what whose property it was on. Um, and then if it was on uh, and uh, a, a, surveys, uh, a survey stamp letter indicating um, where that tree was. Um, was a couple other things. Let me just see here. He was going to um, show on this proposed landscaping plan that um, he would increase the landscaping where that non-compliant driveway had been cut through and move the curbing back to how it was supposed to be in compliance. And that way um, it would create a buffer of vegetation for people not to drive through there. And then also, uh, I think it was discussed that the existing trees that have grown there over the past couple of decades um, had filled in quite nicely and that the three panels of fence that he had included um, down at the driveway near Breakneck Hill Road on the south side, um, that the vegetation that had grown in would suffice as a buffer as opposed to putting a six foot fence along the whole southern perimeter. So he was going to come back with that information, confirm it, and then the planning board was going to decide 
um, at that point. So September 12th is the new um, target for that continued discussion. Great, I think he was also gonna raise the curve back up where that cut through was happening. Correct. So yeah. make sure that's on the list too. Yep, it's there. And um, I had actually um, recapped with um, Justin DePetri um, and Bill the comments um, that were discussed and the, the path forward. Um, so we have an email that um, identifies all that. Anything else, Mr. Mills? That's all I have. Mr. Stein, any comment? So this is not a public hearing, correct? Correct. correct. It's a discussion. Okay. So there's no need for it to vote on a continuance. So no, I do not have any comment. Thank you. Um, I don't either, except I would hope we can hold them to that September date and that this doesn't continue on and on. Does anybody in the audience have anything, any comment on this item? Anybody in Zoom land? Raise your hand. Currently 13 attendees, no hand raised. All right, I guess that's that for this one. On to the next item, uh, discussion of 40B residents at Park Central. Rena, do you wanna kick us off on this one? Sure. So on July 20th, 2022, we received notice from um, Mark Purple, town administrator, that um, the select board had received a letter from Mass Housing indicating that a proposed 40B known as the residents of Park Central um, was moving forward and Mass Housing provided a letter requesting a comment on the application that um, Bill DePetri, I believe the entity is Capital Group Properties, um, is proposing uh, at Zero Turnpike Road uh, for a 40B complex. Um, the letter is asking that the various boards and committees of the town of Southboro provide their comments on the application um, and the site plans that were provided. Uh, so we know that that application and site plans, which pretty big package is posted on the town website. Um, it's also posted um, on the planning board website, I believe. And um, Tomorrow, there'll be a site visit where the boards and committees were invited, certain participants um, of the town. And once that happens, they're expecting some comments back from the various boards. So it's a pretty big document, and um, but this is a good start, I think. So that's where we're at. Okay. So the comments are due back August 22nd. August 22nd. Right. And um, Mark Purple suggested if we want to send one inclusive letter with all the boards that have comments to the select board by August 4th. 4th, that's right. Where this board could decide to write our own letter, which would give us a little more time. <laughs> Do we know what the other boards are doing? Are they? Yeah, so I believe this board absolutely has to write our own letter distinct from the select board. I don't think it should be consolidated. Um, my feeling is part of the application for this is that they have to kind of put information that's true and correct. And, and I am worried based on my reading of certain things that 
certain um, facts haven't been captured accurately. Um, and, you know, I know this is a discussion, but like the use variance is one that says it's still in, in, in um, like active. Still active. And that use variance is subject to many conditions, one of which was approval by the planning board. Never mind the fact that the, the thing was annulled um, in the court system. But so, like, there are comments that I think need to be incorporated into a letter, um, particularly where we had a, um, an opportunity to, to provide commentary. Um, so, I'm a very strong advocate that we write our own letter. I, I agree with Ms. Julianne, and I would just like to ask also, also, is there an opportunity for the public to provide comment? Um, and does that go through Mark Purple back to the select board, or can that come through this board? How would that work <coughs> wanted to comment? Or I think it could go directly back to uh, Mass Housing, that um, the name and email address is right in the application. It's, uh, And just as a, a prior statement, I know um, I, as a citizen, had written a letter to Mass Housing prior um, and when it took it in public comments. So it takes in both the boards and the public comments in the same, same time frame. So I think the public just needs to be aware that it's due by August 22nd. Um, and then that, that is all available, I think, somewhere on our website, right? Yeah, it should be in the, right in yeah. front of the package. The that first letter yeah. has the information to send it to. Part of our agenda packet for the public, and it's on the town yeah. website. It's under the news flash, so it's not on the front page, but just the tab of news, news flash. So if you go to the town website, the main page, and you see a calendar on the right hand side, which usually says um, the current calendar, and it'll have some. A list of three or four public hearings that are coming up very um, soon. Above that are some tabs. And the first tab and the second tab says news flashes. If you click on the news flashes, um, there'll be a link. Um, I think it's the second or third link down that says um, the residents of 40, uh, the residents of uh, at Park Central 40B, right there. Uh, and that takes you to the application and site plans. And it sh should have the letter there as well, I, I would imagine, Com the request letter for comments. Mr. Stein, do you have a, an opinion on the planning board writing its own letter or having ours consolidated with the select board? Well, I agree with, um... oh my God, what's wrong with my Are brain? You? Mimi, uh, Mark, God, sorry, long day. I agree with Mrs. Goulahan. Uh, we should write our absolutely have our own review and our own feedback. I do have a question about the application. Uh, Corinne, I don't know if you uh, know the answer to this, but if you do, is the point of egress from the way I read what's in the system now is actually Route 9 and not flag road, am I missing something? Or did they get mass DOT approval to egress onto Route 9 at this point? I can't answer that. I have to have a chance to review it in more detail to see the site plans. I, I don't know, Jesse, but I can look at it and see if, if it does make any sense that it's stated in there somewhere. Holly, yeah, did you read anything to that effect? It stated that it's accessible to and from Route 9, which is not true. Unless I don't, it, as sure. far as I know, the state has Flag Central, the, you come off Route 9 onto the Flag Central office park, and I think it could be accessible that way. Right, but the way, way it's written in the application, in the application it makes it seem well, as if you right. can get well, in and to out. and from, from Route 9. And, that, and it talks about a private sort of entrance on flag and then two primary entrances on Bantry and Tree. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. So Could you just sorry. identify yourself? Yeah. Please? I have Lincoln. <laughs> really, why well, I'm here to uh, Lincoln Mariner 32 Flag Road. I'm reading up the bottom of page two of the residents at Park Central proposed ownership housing development document. 
At the bottom of that says, proposed interior development roadway will connect two adjacent neighborhoods of Terra Road and Bantry Road. And then an entry off Flag Road as well will be a private development entrance, which I don't know what that means. But so there'll be three entrances basically all feeding off of Flag Road because Bantry and Tara both are dead ends that feed on the flag. So essentially Flag Road bears the entire burden of this complex once again. So that's a huge, and thank you, sir, for adding that input yeah. because I did not know that yet. And that is a huge, huge issue for the town, uh, in my opinion. So it right, just adds further, this further, substance, adds further uh, substance to Marnie's point that we need to formulate our own review and opinion of the project. Thanks. Well, yes. well, 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 one more question. It says industrial zoning district is what this is zoned as now. Mm -hmm. That means to build residences, they would need a variance on no, that. It's, it's a 40B. Oh, yeah. nice. well, 40B bypasses all local zoning. Got it. So you can build anywhere with 40 Got it. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Anyway, so they just moved the traffic one street down on Flag Road. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I think my comment is I think, you know, we have an obligation to our town as to finding it's the it's this has to be true and factual and and signed. Um, also, I think, you know, part of this, I didn't see, I think we as the town should be able to see everything that mass housing gets to see and we didn't get to see, you know, um, some of the other things like the financing and the final signature of the application attesting that everything is true on this document. And I think that's an important, there's the lawyer um, signature, but there is on, he's got that on 6.1, I think, or 6 point, because there's a, a signature page that is not signed, but then later it is. It says there's no litigation. Signature page. Six. I saw the attorney signature saying they completed the application, but I didn't actually see. But I do think it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear my fellow board members that you should write the letter ourselves. So the next question is how we do that. Should we discuss? Um, our comments now and assign somebody to uh, put them together and uh, vote for that person to write because we're not meeting again before before the due. Or not yet. Oh, so you think we should have a, a meeting to write? <laughs> we can't let this one. Yeah, I think we yeah, I think maybe we have a second. You could have a workshop for it. It's not a public hearing before you. Yeah. Just a comment letter. Yeah, maybe we do that. Oh, here it is. Um, Six point five. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> been so chatting tonight. Anyway, can I ask one more question? Um, sure. Anyone else on the board? Uh, is it at all possible to have Flag Road declared part of the historic district of Southborough? As a way to prevent this, do you guys know? No, because technically, if you're doing something to um, keep something else from happening, it doesn't stand up in court. Well, suppose it's written as, you know what, Flag Road has a lot of nice, windy stuff. And it's, you're still doing it after you saw this application come in. So if it, if it would take you to court and you'd lose. So one of the comments that I have is in 2016, a select board met with residents um, of the community and they wrote a letter that said they would not allow left-hand turns onto Flag Road. So that at least the new select board letter had speeding that so there would be no left-hand access out of Flag Road. But it's not going to come down to Andrew and Tara onto the Flag Road. Not that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Just name, address. I was supposed to say Howard Rose to Bantry, member of the advisory, but speaking as, as a citizen. Um, here we go again. Um, I'm not going to get into all this. This is going to have months and months. Just as you write your comments, there's something you may want to consider. 40B is a state mandated project. 
yet the state has denied them access and is forcing it to the town. I find that very telling. Um, I don't want to go back into the whole process, but as you write that, that's a very telling statement, I think, for the state. If the state is going to mandate that we must have this project, then they have to take the requirement of the traffic because we're it should go out on them. Just to put in there, the rest of this, where it's going, this will come out with the ZBA in years, but if you guys are going to have the opportunity to have the comments, we should put all the comments we can into state. And for the record, I'm not necessarily against the project. It's where it comes out, right? It's a good point. We should not tear our town apart to make someone else profitable. If he gets out on nine and wants to build this that way, I don't really have a problem with that. I've been on the record forever. It's all about the access and the safety. Not only are the residents that are there now, but them as well. And the new resident coming in and has to drive on that road. That road bad. So it's not about the building. It has to be stated that way, I think. It's about the access and how they get there has to be um, really thought out. And the state has to set, step up and provide the access to the program that they're requiring to be built. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, yeah. Yes. My name is Kate Shaw. I live at 54 Flag Road. Um, we purchased our home in 2018, apparently two years after this project was approved. And we had no idea that this project was approved. We purchased our home. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, after the public comment was considered in 2016, it was two years after that. We had no idea. We, I purchased a home on a street that was 25 miles an hour because I knew that I was going to have kids on the street. And now you're telling me that there are 100 units of housing that are going to come directly onto this road. I, <laughs> I, I don't know at this point if there's any recourse if they're like i don't know at this point because i'm not familiar enough with the the bylaws and everything but it doesn't feel very fair to all of the homes that have been purchased since 2016 the last time that the public comment was was put into the record which is quite a few there have been quite a few home sales since then and i is it my fault for not doing the due diligence of all the public records and all the public hearings before i bought a home perhaps it is but I don't know. I this seems like a real safety hazard. I'm I'm really concerned about it. So you, you understand this isn't approved, though. I don't understand. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. See, I I, I kind of got that from you. So this is it got all that history in court, and it was the comprehensive permit, which is what they're applying for, was a no. Now they're back okay. to look for sure. another comprehensive permit, and the project is a little bit different. So okay. there's still time for public comment. Okay, great. Fantastic. I guess my only other question is, why is the address of the site zero turnpike road when all of the entrances and exits are on flag and Bantry and Tara? Hmm. My only advice is to go to the news flash and okay. look it up and find the email address because you as a, a person who is in that area yeah. And write a letter and I think that's what you should do is, is see what you know there are specific regulations about a 40 g and I think it's important for you to you know maybe spend a little time on, on understanding what a 40 g requirement is it is an important part of you know being able to provide housing um, and we are under our threshold so it is an important part for us to get up to our 10 percent threshold capacity um, something like this would help us get there but it's mm -hmm. doing it in the right way so um, I think if I can encourage you to do a little diligence, um, you're not behind. Um, you're right at the right time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's not too late. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, I'm Ben Kai's 43 Lovers Lake. Just, just a uh, response to your comment or your question. I'm wondering whether maybe maybe some of you know the answer to this question. Uh, maybe it's called Zero Turnpike Road uh, because the address was decided before Mass DOT denied him access to Route 9. I mean, the only reason he has access to Flag Road at all and, and, and sought access to Flag Road is because Mass DOT prohibited him from accessing Route 9. Well, exiting. Uh, right? ex exiting, yeah. 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 Because it's between 
the flag road uh, exit and the on ramp to 495, which is just very, very compact and right. Cumberland Farm. Right? Yeah. yeah. Because there's like four car lengths. Yeah. For the yeah. So uh, that, that's a, it's a good question. <laughs> why isn't it called, why isn't it a flag road address? Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody has any other thoughts on that or not. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anyone with any comment on that? No hands up, but 13 is still there. So should we try and set a date for a, uh, a letter writing mm -hmm. meeting? <laughs> So do you want to schedule a planning board meeting that will be posted? I don't know if it needs to be posted. We're just going to do it like a working session with the planning board. Well, like at least three would have to be posted. Yeah, we have to post it. If you have a quorum, I believe, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm out of town the 10th, 11th, 12th, but otherwise I'm pretty good at that. Uh, I am away the uh, 12th through the 26th of August. Thank you. I'm so glad so much for you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to the 15th to the 27th. So we could do sometime this week or early next week. Yeah, I think earlier is better. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Just give us time to kind of. Post on the um, we need at least three days to post it, right? What's the posting policy? 48 hours. 48 hours. We could post tonight or so like no, tomorrow for morning Thursday. or Thursday. For Thursday. Thursday or Friday. We can Thursday. Sure. Um, Thursday. Do in person? Or? Do you need an evening or a I, don't, I can do any time probably after 2.30. Do you want a Zoom or do you want to do it in person? Um, or or half or half. That's fine. Can we can we zoom? Can we borrow the zoom, or does it now depend on zoom? You don't have to use the owl, so that's only when you're in person. But you can do a full zoom meeting. Oh, you can. Yep. And yes. we don't have to borrow anybody's zoom. No. Nope. No, we um I can set it up through our zoom. Okay. Sign you in, and you guys can have zoom. So I can do anytime after two thirty on Thursday. If you guys want to do day or evening, three. three. Can you zoom on the fourth, um, Jesse? I can. What, what time works for you? Uh, yeah, that afternoon or evening. Okay. After five. After five. On, on three, so whatever. What if we did like start at three, right? There's a quorum of us. You could kind of come in and see where we are at. I mean, I'd love to just kind of get our thoughts on them. So three o'clock, Jesse. Uh, yes, that works. I'll put it in my calendar. The three o'clock. Just a board Zoom meeting, and it's going to be a work session for your letter. Yeah. One thing on the agenda. Yes. So these will have to be posted tomorrow before probably one o'clock so that town clerk has an opportunity to post it in time before three o'clock for Thursday. Um, and it's going to be a Zoom meeting yep, that just Zoom. Colleen can set up through the, the, the same way we set up the Zoom meetings in the past. It'll go through a um, remote meeting room through the IT department. And then um, you might just wanna make sure there should be a meeting room open at that time. Yeah, we have three accounts. I can't imagine there's three meetings. At, at three, three right. Yeah. Oh, I can just go to our calendar, my calendar, hold on. Let's see here. Calendar. So Thursday, 
the fourth. Um, there appears to be a 9 a.m. and a 7 p.m. So on the fourth, three o'clock looks open. And then Andrew would join after. Yeah, he'd swing in towards the end. If it's still going on. If it's still going on. It'll still be going on. <laughs> and is Debbie, Is I hadn't heard from Debbie. Is she still there? Yeah, she's sitting on here. I'd like to join too. I'll join. I hate to bring up uh, a tough subject, but d d are, is, we have a, a couple of members um, on the board now who are not on the board the last time this was in front of us. Are, are either Marnie or Deb uh, a butters for the project? I wasn't the first time. Oh. No, um, but the board's not hearing matter, right? So I don't think that a recusal will be necessary for a letter. Okay. Okay. Just letter. wanted to check. Thank you. I'm not a butter. Yeah. And maybe that should just be clear to the public as well that the planning board is not going to be reviewing such a matter. Mm -hmm. That was confirmed by town council, from what I understand. Right. It's an opportunity to write a letter. It's an opportunity to write a letter for site eligibility right now. Right. So for the the main point Marnie, that you brought up in terms of this needs to be correct, the totally agree with you. Is that something that town council needs to say? Or like I mean I, if, I think it's like any application. You know, that this is what they're showing you now. Things can change as it goes along. This I don't believe is the application to the towns. This no, is the application the for well, it's still it should be yeah. factual. Right. And the you use there is, off with a, was predicated. Well, that should be part of your letter. You believe it's the, not fully so. factual. Question the application. So we have then uh, I think I think if we have town council agree on the key pieces. That aren't factual in it, it would be huge. It's not just a piece that she said. The town council said yes. Do you have, if you have uh, specific points, why don't you email them to Karina and I and we'll, well see what we can do? It's the, I don't, I, the special I, waiver. I honestly don't know if that's a, a concern and maybe it's something the planning board should put on the table right now is that. Town Council represented um, the zoning board on this, where we were kind of on polar opposites. So I don't know if we would need special counsel to opine on. Didn't you, was it Talonman? Because we have a new town. He came council. in at the last. Oh, days. he did. Oh, yes, okay. he did. I thought he was not part of this. So I would, I would wonder if we should maybe ask if a special counsel should be designated the planning board to, to review that point. But my only That's concern is that um, if we could, so that would have to be approved by the select board and would have to find a special counsel. They would have to opine and it would have to be before August 22nd. We just write the letter right. based on what we know of the facts. Right. I don't think it hurts to still put that request in anyway. Just to get rid of. Oh, okay. And you know how I feel about that. <laughs> because I think at some point we're going to probably be asked to continue to make comments based on what how we were involved before. And we're going to need legal assistance with that this is my the way I see it sliding right well so, so it would be best if we started that and say hey we need special town council or a special term to help represent us in this why do, why do you need this representation 
I don't understand. If we have any questions along the way. So although this isn't before us, our, our comments and our review should get funneled through the zoning board. As, as a board or as a? As a board. As a board. So because the zoning board handles it, it doesn't mean that everybody else is shut out. Right. All of our comments should go through the zoning board. <laughs> and yeah, I don't, I don't think it would hurt to ask the select board to grant us special counsel if we need it for this process. So, hey, Mamie. Yes. I think I'm missing why we would need special counsel in this situation. For the for the for the entire project as it moves forward. But other than other than Mr. Towerman? Yes. And why would that be? Um, because he represented the uh, zoning board. Well, when you say represented as in the past tense. Are you referring to the use variance? Referring to um, the comprehensive permit okay. and the use variance, one, so, one full project. In, in this case though, it was not actually Mr. Tallerman. It was the previous town council, right? Well, Mr. Tallerman uh, stepped in when the previous council stepped out. It's just a little confusing because if I'm remembering correctly, Mr. Tallerman was called in to defend the planning board from the sanctions that uh, Capital Group had sort of countersued for. Was that, am I mistaken? Is my memory serving me correctly? I don't remember that. If he did, he did do a very good job. We should, we should start with. Jesse, I believe with. there is something to that because um, I, when yeah. I was just talking to Colleen about this the other day, after talking to um, Town Council Talaman, um, regarding the process and how the planning board would be involved. And he indicated that, you know, this 40B is all, you know, the public hearing is all ZBA. And he mentioned to me that um, the planning board by all means should comment on any past concerns they had as well, i.e. Uh, traffic related issues that they had, that this comment letter should, in, the planning board has all the right in the world to comment on any of their prior concerns. Um, and I thought that Talaman was, special counsel, that um, town council, Aldo Cipriano at the time was town council and that the select board had um, at, so, at some point made Talam and asked him to be the special counsel to the planning board. Right, and I think it was at the point when Capital Group sued us for sanctions in, re in retaliation for our pro se filing against them. That's how I remember. Right, and there was recovery of funds. Th on that basis, you know, I think we're kind of like starting, this is kind of a reboot from our perspective legally. And I think it's a little bit early to be thinking along the lines of trying to retain outside counsel for this board. Um, so I, I just... I'm, I'm, I'm hearing like we're us talking about getting outside counsel like before we've even, you know, submitted our comments to the ZBA. It just seems a little early. That's all. Thanks. Taliban was defending the town from Mr. from Capital Group. Right. No, from, <coughs> from the town. But he was representing the town. Right. He, so you as a planning board would be town, and he specializes in board. The planning board was not on the same side as the board. 
That's where it's getting confused. Right. So yes. we denied the or so, they denied the application. So this we, we can at least ask him what the hell he did and can he do it again? <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. No, 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 we don't that. that. <laughs> we don't want to do that again. No, no, no. I you know what I mean. If he can represent if he's I think if we ask the question, if we get to the point where we need a lawyer, is it Tellerman who's going to do it or do we who should we have somebody else? And specifically, again, like if I think if we're going to say, you know, this is not accurate, we should have someone from the town attorney's standpoint agree, yeah, it's not accurate. Well, I don't see why town council could do that. Yeah, he could do that. Worth the ask. So we have to actually write the letter first right. for him to opine on what's written to say. Well, he can look at the application too and tell us what he thinks of it while you're writing the letter. Well, specifically the use variance. Yeah, I think the use variance is a question. Because the application says the use variance was not appealed and remains in effect. A variance is only good for one year. That's why they used. Well, so this variance was only effective following the final board approval of the 40B, which approval shall be final with, with is what it says, but all appeals have expired. So it was never finalized because it was annulled. Right. So there was no bar there's no variance. The variance never I agree with my you that. my legal interpretation, which is worth nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Except for I is that the variance you. never went into effect. Right. So can, do you, for the for those who are here that are very interested in this, you know, what the next steps we're going to take, since it's going to be an internal working group and probably not going to be be able to partake. Can we at least bullet what were the, the headers that we're going to uh, topic? I think, you know, the legality of this is one. Right. So, the, the, right. What's been proposed is the development. I think there's some, like, we'd like to just document based on what, what our knowledge is of the space, yeah. right? Egress, things like that. So, that would be one. Um, Can you say that use, again? Uh, egress. Traffic. Uh, Traffic, which is also safety, kind of yeah. scenic road. I mean, there's, there's certain things that maybe we can't really get into. The use variance. Uh, well, the use variance. In the placement of the building and things like that, it's not something we can really uh, touch or, or okay. should really. You can ask whatever you want. I think we should provide perspective as a planning board, the yeah. unit kind of holistically thinking about the future plans of our town. Because the, the placement of this current building right up next to the homes that are on Tarrant Entry that kind of tower over them. Right. An <coughs> urban, urban apartment building. Like there's nothing that blends that into the sort of Lake you know, neighborhoods that it's do the planning board members um, have a, you know, specifically Marnie or Mimi who've looked at this um, and have noticed what they perceive as inaccuracies, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but are you able to list these inaccuracies that could be at least listed in the comment letter and say we have concerns with these parts of the application um, based on our history, we're not sure that this is accurate. And you portray that in the letter. So at least it gets on the record. And then, you know, a path can be taken, um, whosever jurisdiction it is, to determine if it is accurate or not. Um, someone can then, it can then go to town council, who, who the select board may ask, can you verify the accuracy of these um, you know, these questions. There are questions on the accuracy of parts of the application. Or do you ask Mass Housing, you include it in the letter and you say, Mass Housing, the planning board has concerns that these particular things are accurate. And then Mass Housing takes it upon because they're going to be the, the supporter of this, bringing this to the ZBA, right? They're the funding agency, so to speak, to make this happen. So I'm sure that they want to know that their application is accurately 
provided to them, the information in it. So they may have counsel who will review based on the comments that the planning board has with the historic knowledge to review those issues that you are pointing out specifically and they have their counsel review it. You know, I mean, there's different options here. I don't know Mass Housing's protocol. Do they have town, they should have counsel, not town council, but they should, they likely have counsel to review these because it's funding. When there's money, there's lawyers, right? So I would yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. suggest that you list out, um, if you notice any inaccuracies, start putting this list together from what you know could be questionable and make sure you that's included in the comment letter saying, we are concerned that these things stated are inaccurate. That way you're so saying- So we were just doing that list. So we came with egress, traffic safety, scenic road, use variance. I think Mr. Rose's comment about the 40 B mandated project that the state has denied access is a really good point. Yeah, yeah and the site is and not the address, accessible. I think is another really access. good question. The site is not accessible yeah. to which is that's the question. Oh, that's okay, great. And also the Conservation yes. Commission denied the order of conditions. They have to be served on the application of working with the Conservation Commission. Yeah. I have a question too with the annul means because being a Catholic, annulment means it never happened. That's what it means. That's so, what it happened. <laughs> you know, like it just never happened. So That's, I don't know if you can use that then. If there's, you know, you have past knowledge, but I don't know how that affects. What was revoked? So it, yeah, says. Well, just in speaking okay. to town council, when I asked him, you know, what do you call it? Because I was asking him, you know, did he prepare a formal letter indicating the status of Park Central after the court um, a decision on the right. com comprehensive? He said, I said, what would you call it? it is annulled an okay term? And he didn't disagree. He said, well, it's basically yeah. annulled. But you're right, annulled, it might have several meanings though. So. Any comments? Sure. Uh, ben Kai's 43 Lovers Lane. Uh, it's my understanding that the word annulled, it, it just means the decision of the zoning board approving the comprehensive permit was annulled so that that, that approval no longer had legal merit anymore, which means that the comprehensive yeah. permit was no longer valid. Uh, I don't think that means in any way that, that any of the, the fact gathering and information that <clears throat> residents or boards gathered along the way is now therefore unusable. No, I don't um, think it's yeah, unusable. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how much yeah. effect it will have. Yeah, yeah, I think that what the, the annulling is the decision of the zoning board approving a comprehensive permit. Gotcha. And uh, and that's, yeah, that's what is, that, that decision no longer um, is valid um, legally. I had a, I had a, a question. Um, for, for one, one comment, just this one might be worth pursuing. I, I believe in the in the trial of the appeal the last time around, Jay Tallerman represented the zoning board for a short while, for a couple of days at the trial. And I'm not sure whether that was because Alba Cipriano had stepped down and 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 Jay Tallerman was his replacement or not. He, he did at some point during the trial, I believe, represent the zoning board, just taking up what, what attorney Cipriano had been had been doing previously in the trial. Um, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. No, I, I have to confess my ignorance. I have not read all the information that is available on the website, but, but what can someone summarize for me what the status of the use experience is in the mind of the developer? Have, have, <laughs> what, why? Because I just was talking to Howard Becker. Why does he need a use variance at all? And the use variance originally was to combine market rate housing and the 40 B together and get it treated as a 40 B. And that's what the judge said. No, you can't do that. Right. Um, what does, why does he need one now if it's well, just a 40 B? So perhaps not to combine it, but he could uh, do townhouses that aren't part of a 40 B use variance. So according to him, the use variance for market rate projects was not appealed and remains in effect. That's what he said in the application. It was not, it was not appealed within the, the, the date, but then the whole project that he was relying on the use variance for. Correct. Was, my, yeah. my interpretation yeah. is that it never went into effect because- It was never- the yeah. Correct. It was contingent on approval from the world right. boards. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. It just well, obviously, I need to go read that. <laughs> <laughs> the formal order for judgment was the decision of the board is annulled and the permit is revoked. Yeah. Revoked. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can I make a little more request? Sure. Okay. I'll test. Uh, Lincoln Merrick, U32 flag, as you're writing up your concerns, can you split the safety into two pieces? Number one is vehicular traffic, car accidents. The second, which I think was overlooked last time, is pedestrians. Flag Road has 20 different dead end streets off of it or so. I don't know the exact number. Anyone who walks or runs or goes to school Ride comes or rides a bike, comes down off those side streets onto flag. And if you have 800 or 400 new cars, you have 200 units, two to three bedrooms each, probably two drivers per, let's say, coming out in there. There's risk for car accidents all over, but also for people being killed and kids and strollers and old people and runners and bikers. So I'd like those listed. I'm going to send a letter too, but I think if we all say the same thing, two separate. Uh, one last thing is in rereading this document, it's four story buildings that sit over a parking garage. So probably five stories tall. Four different buildings. So it would tower over Terra. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. I think that that was the points, the highlights. Did I need your points? Yeah. Mr. Rose? That tall building will not presume. So that's like that. Zoning doesn't count. Yeah. Zoning doesn't count. I thought height restrictions were still within the 40 meters of discussion. So I, I believe the zoning code, um, I'm sorry, the building code changes after five floors and then everything changes to the fire safety, everything. So it's much more expensive to build six floors than five. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, they're at four and maybe five. And we have a truck that goes to five. I don't know. That's why one of the reasons we have that bar in our town. But I, well, my understanding is, really could good. I ask who's speaking? Because it's not coming through if they're too far away. Oh, Howard Rose. I'm sorry. sorry. It's your real yep. camera here. Um, okay. Howard Rose, I was just uh, asking uh, with 40B if height was a requirement. I believe our town has a limitation on the height of the buildings, and it was four stories, I believe. Which is if it's four stories on top of a parking garage, that's five stories, and that could be a challenge for fire apparatus, et cetera. So I was wondering, I didn't believe 40 d um, could bypass that, but I'm certainly not the expert on that. So. You can't bypass public safety. It's a yeah. fire department. You can buy a fire that truck, in. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> definitely put that in the letters. Yeah, well, that's why I'm asking if you're writing a letter now. That's if they're that tall, then that's certainly a concern. So. And it's expensive for a big ladder truck. Yes, it is. I would also encourage the planning board is going to write our own, but I would encourage you to write your select board oh, as well as mass housing. And our public safety. Might as well make the rounds. Okay. So it's at the on this day before we'll write a letter. Next is School Street, Stonewall, and Scenic Road. Kalina? Sure. Uh, I still haven't drafted that letter yet, but it's in the works. There's two infractions that the planning board at prior meeting wanted me to draft a letter to the select board um, and the building commissioner regarding the stone wall at the um, intersection of St. Mark's and School Street. And at Latisquama, at the corner of Latisquama. Um, so I'm working on those. They kind of fell to the back burner, but we'll get those out. And before they do, we'll circulate that. I'll circulate them with the planning board members. The goal is to have them ready for the next meeting so that we can get those submitted. I just have one yeah. comment on the, um, the stone wall at St. Mark's. There was some question of whether it existed, but it shows on those on the VHB plans, it says remove stone wall. 
It's also in the aerial mapping on the GIS town mapping oh, wow. because that's from 2011. So they have aerial photography that shows the stone wall there. And um, um, I have some feedback from Debbie who provided some good um, photos before and after um, that we can use to supplement the letter. So there'll be some attachments so that it's very clear of uh, what the planning board's concerns are. Okay. Anything else on that? No, Mr. Stein, anything on that issue? Nope, okay. Um, the next item, National Grid Tree Vegetation Maintenance Tree Removal. So um, I'll speak a little bit on that and then Colleen, if you have anything else, you can add it. So um, you may recall, we asked town council um, the requirements for scenic road public hearings for national grid. And at the same time, uh, we drafted a letter um, from the planning board to the select board, which um, was um, included with your packet last meeting on July 11th. Um, asking the select board to, as the tree warden to request vegetation management plans and hazard uh, management plans, hazard tree management plans to the town under chapter 87, section 14 of Master in the Law so that um, this could be handled once a year, um, a process they submit their management plans, uh, a hearing is held and then they're good to go. Um, based on the outcome of you know, what those plans indicate. Um, so I haven't heard back yet if that's on the agenda, but Mimi, I think you were going to reach out to Kath, the chair of the select board to see if that was on the upcoming agenda for August 9th. So as you recall, we have a joint meeting at the select board scheduled uh, with the planning board to do a scenic road tree hearing consolidated with the tree warden hearings. Um, for about 105 trees, um, 25 of which are resident requested removals of trees and another 72 or so of uh, off the um, Arbor's, Arbor's certified dead tree list. Um, so there's a lot of work been going on there. So that's gonna be heard on the August 9th. It's been, um, publicly advertised with a legal ad is posted, um, but I digress. So town council opined that um, they just need to, the, the tree warden needs to post the trees and the planning board needs to have a consolidated hearing and post a legal ad, which is done by the tree warden. There's no butter notification required. Um, so on my to-do list is uh, I reached out to David Donahue at National Grid who's been corresponding um, with the planning department on their scenic road tree removal applications. And I think it would be a good idea once I touch base with him, he was, he was on vacation last week, to maybe plan um, to have a meeting with him, uh, maybe Mimi and maybe a select board member and the tree warden designee Chris Leroy and we meet him on site or whoever their person is and now that we have information from Christina that National Grid usually has a regional person who deals with this um, make sure that that's the person involved um, as well as David Donahue um, so initially we had indicated to them that they had to do an abutters list and they balked at that understandably so that's when we went to town council and asked his opinion so we're gonna let them know that um, that's not the case, but they still need public hearing uh, for scenic road stone, stonewall um, tree removal. Um, and that we've also sent this letter to the select board requesting these vegetation management plans that hopefully they would be, will be ex expecting that request to come through. So it'll give them a heads up. Um, so if that's all right with the board. So in the meantime, I'm like I said, I'm gonna reach out to National Grid and try and coordinate, get an understanding of, you know, where they're at, let them know where Southborough is at as far as from the planning board's perspective, and that they do need to have a public hearing, um, and that it could be handled through these vegetation management and hazard management plans in a much more streamlined manner. Um, 
than these line drawings because they submit these drawings and they kind of show a path, but it really doesn't indicate the trees. It's just a very generic location. So I think that has to be defined more and we can work with the tree warden designee, the national grid to hone in on getting this done for them so that the town has more information. Anything that was one long that? sentence, by the way. <laughs> and get my thoughts out. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add, thank you, Karina, for taking that on. Um, I mean, I think we've been trying to get ahead of the curve on this. And um, I think, um, you know, getting copies of these vegetative management, I guess, um, plans. I don't know what they are. What, what are they, the plans that they sent? Um, we've been wanting to get a, sort of on top of it so we can understand. Um, I, I think you know it's been kind of clear that um, National Grid has plans that are one, two, and three years out, and yet we don't exactly know what the plans are. So I think this gets a little a little bit closer to what they're doing, and also lets them know that we're a player in this. And actually, hearing from what Christina has said tonight, and knowing that there are uh, possibly even they could be a partner. With us, um, I think it opens up some new possibilities. It's pretty exciting. So thanks for all your work on that. Oh, and uh, kudos to um, to Colleen because she was doing all the initial corresponding with them and following up with town council. So hit, hit a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next tree protection bylaw and scenic roads. Well, that's you, Mimi, and Marty. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, well, the one thing is that uh, we need to decide whether we're going to open hearings again, which we would have to decide today to have three before the next, before August, August, October 13th, which is um, special town meeting. Is that correct, Karina? That's correct. So October 13th is the special town meeting. I think it's 630, but I'm not sure yet. Um, so in order to backtrack to have enough time to do the proper um, public notifications, legal ad, etc. Um, we have to let the newspaper know by this Wednesday. Um, so we we have legal ads from the last go round of these public hearings. Again, they're not required. But the planning board in the past has wanted to have the public hearings for these um, two Warren articles in order to have transparency. So um, we need to let the newspaper know this Wednesday, August 3rd, so that we can publish an ad on August 8th and August 15th. And then the third Monday is August 22nd, which will open the public hearings at the planning board meeting for August 22nd. And um, we would post your draft uh, Warren articles uh, whatever condition you have them in, if you're ready, uh, as a starting point. And then um, I already know there's some small uh, changes. I don't know if you can say small, but there's some changes regarding the tree fund, et cetera, that you're going to work on, Mimi. And I believe, Marnie, you were consulting with the Conservation Commission and the Historic Commission um, to get gather their support for the scenic roads. So that's the schedule. So we just want to the know first, the planning board. First thing we need to decide whether we want to open hearings. Yes. 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 Jesse, okay. are you yes. on board with that? Okay. So that's the first thing. Um, I have. So the tree protection bylaw. I've because now we realize that the select board are the tree wardens in. Uh, Mr. Leroy is the tree warden designee, so I've tweaked the language in the bylaw a little. And then the second thing is that um, the several members on the select board are not fans of the revolving fund, which we had in there. And I spoke with um, a couple members of the board and they had um, suggested that we have a Warren article like facilities does that's funded every year for a certain amount, but it doesn't um, it doesn't sundown on 630 if it's not spent, it you keep accumulating so it can build so you can um, so it's like a revolving fund. 
but it doesn't evolve. But it's, <laughs> well, it's funded through town meeting and not through fees and, and fines, which we would probably have to wait a while for unless there was some egregious uh, event. We'd have to wait a while before we have enough to. Uh, yeah. And I personally, that's not my biggest um, hurdle in getting this passed. And if that's the thing that we'll get the snack for. Yeah. And who, who, remind me who the administrator is on that? It would be the planning board. Okay. It would be a sign off the planning board and the tree warden or tree warden designator, whatever we decided. And we would also decide how that would be spent. So are we okay with that with instead that. of a revolving fund? Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Stein? No objection. Okay. So that's what I have on the tree protection. Anything on scenic? Yeah, on scenic, I uh, presented the conservation, and I would say the majority of them kind of are in the same mind of, you know, if we, and I think it was Tim Litt's recommendation from the last planning board meeting, like if you try to define what scenic road means, you have to kind of go back in time and pull the ones that don't meet those definitions. So I think um, they, they didn't vote. Uh, they asked me to do further research. Um, I was um, busy last week, so I wasn't able to do all of it, but they wanted me to, the, we cited towns, like uh, six towns, like Hopkin, Hopkinton, Marlboro, Wayland, North, Northborough, that all do define what scenic road means. And most of them have, it has public shade trees and stone walls in them. Um, and there are other criteria, but I, you know, I need to collect that information and Kevin Miller has reached out to me to kind of at least have a conversation um, and continue the conversation. Um, and conservation also wanted to continue the conversation. So there are still open answers um, as to whether or not they would jointly sponsor it. So at this time, with the warrant being posted, I think we'd still just say it's planning board, um, but we might be able to mend that on the floor just to say it's jointly sponsored, but I don't have that answer yet. Okay. All right. Mimi, Good also, morning. is there, um, is there um, the language for the warrant article for this replenishment fund? Um, is that something we should ask town council? to draft? Um, I was going, I think, I was gonna get that from um, Chelsea, I think was gonna send me that. Or I can okay. try and, it's similar to what facilities does, so I can try and get that if I don't. Uh, Look back that. and see if we can find, yeah, see if we can find how they did their article. Uh, we can ask John Parent if, if he was there, at the, he must've been there at the time. Okay. so. You, you're going to check with Chelsea. We'll see what we can find too. Okay. And the next discussion is um, accessory apartments. And um, at the, and I'll take this one. And at the 720 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting, Doris Cahill brought up amending uh, the accessory apartment section of the zoning code and the ZBA decided to reach out to Andrew Dennington who um, contacted me. And I know that um, amending the uh, accessory apartment section of the code is a goal of the master plan to allow accessory apartments by right. Um, so I wanted to ask the planning board if that is something that they would be willing to work on for possibly the annual town meeting. That so, uh, is something I've been advocating for a while. So yes. Okay. So I'm just curious because um, so I know in the past I was advised by planning board to write it first and draft it and bring it to the planning board. Are you suggesting the planning board write it or have the person draft it or who? What would the role of planning board be in this? Be anything. I would um, 
I guess I'd reach back out to Doris and Andrew and see if they wanted to um, present the draft for us to discuss. I'm, I'm yeah. Does that sound okay, Jesse? Yep. Okay. And next discussion is environmental controls bylaw. And I think that's you, Debbie. Yeah. Mimi, before you go on, what is Doris's last name? Hey, Hill. <coughs> okay. Got it. Sorry. Thank you. So, um, Colleen, I don't know if you're able to put up that document that I had yeah. sent. So, what this is about is um, really taking uh, what the noise bylaw committee has done and take it to the next level. So, for anybody that's um, been, you know, had participated in um, numerous uh, meetings and outreach that the noise bylaw committee had done. Um, they were um, defining the scope um, within their document. At one point, it carried um, both the uh, bylaw uh, pertaining to residents and commercial, you know, lawnmowers and this sort of thing. Um, it's it sometime during those hearings they attempted to um, tackle industrial noise, and it proved to be a little bit kind of burdensome, I would say. And I don't think the whole committee was sort of on board. But there was a lot of good comments and stuff that came out of that from the committee and from people who, who called in. Um, I think they actually put in a draft of some language that made it to the select board. And at the end, the select board asked them to remove it in order to get it to the town meeting. Um, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to um, see if we can um, come a little closer to addressing what's known as either stationary or industrial noise. Um, and so what this does is I think it, it, um, it takes it just a step further from, from what the, you know, carrying on what the noise bylaw uh, committee had done. Now the Board of Health is also looking at this and for anybody who's been following Board of Health, um, they have a, uh, an intern that is a public health, um, working with public health uh, director, Heather Alper, and um, he's looking at, I think, rules and regulations regulations for Board of Health. Um, but I don't think that they're looking to prepare a bylaw. So I went looking, uh, didn't have to go too far, and I found um, in Westboro, um, they have a, uh, a bylaw that in addresses industrial noise. And it would be something similar to what I think, um, you know, our own noise bylaw kind of came up with it. First, I wanted to give sort of where, where this comes from and how noise is is regulated. And um, I, I guess there's sort of a lot, it, you know, noise is a funny thing because it's, um, it's regulated under, you know, environmental um, controls and environmental quality, air quality. But just to start, so it's, in 1978, um, the, uh, there was an amendment to the Massachusetts um, Constitution um, and this is it, what we have up here on the screen. And I just want to read, this is sort of the preamble, in my opinion, to why noise is regulated. And also why noise is regulated under zoning. Um, and so I highlighted the move. People have a right to clean air and water freedom from excessive and unnecessary noise, and the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic qualities of their environment. And the protection of the people and their right to conservation development and utilization of agriculture, mineral, forest, water, air, and other natural resources is hereby declared to be a public purpose. Um, and then the general court shall have the power to enact legislation ne necessary or expedient to protect such rights. Um, and so this gives cities and towns the opportunity to um, regulate noise. Um, what, so what I did is I, I found um, one of the most simple, I think, um, kind of wording, if you would just scroll down a little bit, um, you know, right, didn't have to go too far. Um, this is the wording that Westboro uses. And it's worth it for anybody who's listening or wants to know about industrial noise. And certainly that wasn't the focus of um, noise by law committee, but they really did a, a pretty nice job in entertaining um, 
comments and we just you know found out that it wasn't just you know one area of town but there's people that live near 495 the pike um some you know, uh, facilities down along route nine so industrial noise is becoming a problem and the suburbs are getting louder and louder um i was looking at westboro because um they have um recently approved an amazon facility um on the addresses of 4400 computer drive and and they have also um you know it, it's in a very kind of similar situation i guess from you know as south Bro, i guess but in terms of it's kind of as close to residential area but um in the in the original language i think that was in our draft noise bylaw um the board of health proposed to put in some language that basically was um written into mass general law they didn't want to stray from that they they said well we want to you know stick stick to that even though there was other guidance that, that could go along with that such as the massachusetts um association of boards of health put out guidelines for towns so many towns have you know just use those guidelines westboro does something different and i think it's fairly simple um, one of the things that came up for under the, you know, for the noise bylaw committee is that um, from the, um, the some of the um, comments coming in from the police chief at the time were that you know they didn't want to carry any kind of like a noise meter around with them. If they get a call and you know somebody is being too loud, they, they didn't want to have to sort of try to measure the noise. And also, what if the noise is gone by the time that they get there? So that was problematic. But with industrial noise, you would expect that the noise is, you know, it's just ongoing. It could be, um, you know, chronic, I suppose. Um, and so one of the comments that the uh, chair mentioned, and he he was, as Peter, good, good noise. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. And he, he was, a, um, I tried, I have not been successful in, in reaching anybody from the noise island yet, but. Um, I wanted to bring it to you guys today, but as a, as a former police officer, he kind of attested to that fact and said it's kind of cumbersome to show up with some sort of meter and try to measure or something like that. That's just something that, like, you know, have, have to be training involved and that sort of thing. Um, so this bylaw that I've got here up on the screen is Westboro's bylaw, and basically it falls under a section of their zoning code, um, and it's called Environmental Controls. And there's other things under there also that I didn't put here, but we may want to consider um, that have you know to do with um, other conservation measures in ensuring you know in this case that um, people have a right to you know enjoy their environment. So this is simple. It basically says um, no use shall be allowed if it causes sound, noise, vibration, odor, or flashing. Uh, except for warning devices, temporary construction or maintenance work, parades, recreational activity, or other special circumstances that is perceptible without an instrument more than 400 feet from boundaries um, in an industrial district, more than 200 feet from the boundaries uh, of the originating premises in a business district. Um, so it's fairly simple. I wanted to, you know, just kind of bring it um, to the, you know, the board here tonight just to see if it's something that you know, whether we like this one or not, you know, could this be something that um, the planning board might want to um, take up, uh, you know, as a future, um, as a future one of them. I just want to mention too that um, there's, um, in the Westboro code, um, I just went back and checked, checked this section and I know that I sent the um, link um, but it goes on to um, additional um, conservation type measures or, uh, that you would you know, want for your um, environment. And, and one of them has to do with um, parking and parking lots. And um, I didn't know if we wanted to look at that or if that's something we want to do later. But I guess the first thing is I wanted to know if I it has the will to sort of take this uh, take, take this on this would be essentially you know i guess a bylaw uh, to put in place south Rose stance on noise and odor and i like odor in there to be honest because it doesn't just focus on noise but as it turns out 
the Board of Health was um, battling uh, some something along the lines of an, an odor event earlier um, this year. Um, and I, I don't know that I knew some of the details of it, but so it, it can be um, a nuisance. It's a public nuisance. Um, and it's a, you know, um, so it's something that we could look at. We were interested in. So I just wanted to open up to see if anybody's, you know, what your thoughts might be. So if it's a, a zoning bylaw, it has nothing to do with the Board of Health, correct? Well, that's correct. So they, they might have, I, I did, you know, send this to this copy to um, the public health director, the chair, um, to get their thoughts. I, it's, it's vacation times. So I, I haven't heard back. I also sent it to a couple of members on noise uh, tribal committee, but I haven't heard back. Um, yes, if it's a zoning bylaw, it would be, I would be sponsored by them. Um, but I very much think it should kind of dovetail into the work that the Board of Health is taking on with their rules and regulations. Um, and, and as that's a, um, coming out of the noise bylaw process, um, that if, you know, there's sort of a, some direction, I think, in that bylaw, that the first line is to call police. Police decide, is this something for the Board of Health? If it is, it goes over to the Board of Health. Something like industrial noise would go to the Board of Health. Um, and then, so they're trying to put some procedures in to, for that aspect, I think. What happens if they get a phone call? What are the procedures? And under the law, what is it that they're allowed to do? So this, I think, would be complementary to what they're trying to do. Yeah. Is that a zoning bylaw would be enforceable by a zoning code enforcement? That's right. And so this is how Westboro has its fair set up. Check out this plan. I think it's interesting. I think it's worth looking at. Mr. Stein? Uh, I'm fairly ambivalent on this one, personally. I feel like we already have sufficient protections in the town and probably more um, in the code than can actually even be enforced by the zoning code, you know, enforcement officer or building inspector. Uh, so I'm, I'm not exactly against what uh, Mr. Mira is proposing, but um, I don't really see... Um, an urgent need for it either. Thanks. Yeah, so I am. Um, so I understand the premise and I agree. I think the noise um, odor, I think there's some things that would be um, interesting for us to pursue. Um, and I wondered, like, um, Ms. Demiria, from your perspective, from a timeline, I feel like we are trying to do a lot um, in the most recent months. So we've uh, added uh, an elimination bylaw. Um, and now we hopefully will have some scenic tree laws. So are you looking for the next um, annual town meeting in March? Is that when we have them? March? Yeah. In March? I think that would make sense. I don't think that this is going to be anywhere near ready for fall. Um, I, I see as well, there's really no timeline on this. I do see a sense of urgency. I have to disagree with um, the previous comment. There's a, quite a number of people who um, are living in residential um, districts, but they're very close to and abutting um, industrial or business districts where there's noise or where they're concerned about noise. And it became pretty clear that we don't really have that covered so well. But um, I think annual town meeting would be a better place for it. And then I just have one other question just from a bylaw perspective. And so as we think about site plan regulations and if we're imposing kind of restrictions around um, building an industrial zone or business districts, is that something that would be done through also through zoning a site like a site plan condition or something like that, like where you could where you could as a planning board about that, is that a zoning thing that we'd have to bring into law through town meeting? Do you know what I'm trying to say? You could try to do a regulation. I'm tired. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting late. You could try and do a regulation. That's what I mean, like a regulation that you could kind of bring into a site plan process because you can't. 
retroactively fit it right for the, the businesses that are there but moving forward if you could bring it in through it right like i'm just wondering if there are other methods for including it other than a bylaw other than a bylaw rules and regulations are easier because easier, you can make them for yourself but do they get enforced by the zoning code enforcement officer probably not but if it's in a decision right um, that's a good question for town council. You need to have a basis for the rules and regulations. So like with the special permit for lower impact development, there's code and then there's a policy. With outdoor illumination, we have a code and then there's the rules and regulations. Um, trying to think if there's other areas that. So you'd have to have something in the code to base those, to, to, to link to the rules and regulations to make them enforceable. Okay. Right. So if you, if you know, yeah, that's my two, that from my experience here, that's what I see. If you just have rules and regulations, how do you enforce that? It, it's just a suggestion then. It's like with the downtown district, right? Um, when that district passed, there's design guidelines, but the design guidelines are enforceable and effective by the planning board because they're tied to the district criteria. Answer your question. I, I think it's a question of where this would yeah that's kind of where I'm thinking about it like where would it fall yeah any questions from the audience Hi. yes you at the front desk Freddie <laughs> Gillespie 78 South Hill Road um for I can see a need for this if you, you know I, I see the vibration and I hadn't thought of odor but um flashing lights too but um kind of have that covered I think under the light bylaw but um and you have a noise bylaw but so I'm thinking more on the vibration and now older but um why would you allow it anywhere off the premise I don't see why there would be a difference from industrial or business or residential like you can't do something on your property I think that makes causes a vibration into your neighboring I don't care what district it's in right I mean if you have an, an inconvenience by a vibration, um, shaking your house, say, when a train goes by. Like, I understand the trains, you're not, you know, where you live with them, they have a, they're exempt from any uh, public transportation laws. Um, but I can't imagine being in a home that has to deal with that from some other source. And it, I don't care if it's another res A or res B or, you know, residential of any one, shouldn't be impacted, but neither should another business. What if you're at your desk trying to do work and all of a sudden your whole windows are shaking and you know, like, does it happen? I think sometimes it does. And, you know, like once in a while, I've been, um, this exempts temporary, right? Like, have you ever lived near where they've done drilling for like getting rid of rock when they're doing construction? Or, oh, the mass pipe, right? So can you imagine if that was the type of thing that wasn't temporary? And so I don't see why you wouldn't have, um, and I know for some people who were dealing with the mass pipe and construction, it didn't feel like it was temporary because it went on and on and on, but you knew at some point it was going to end. So I, and it's, I don't know why you would have, if you were going to move forward, I don't know why you'd have any 400 feet, like what, you live 200 feet away or your office is 300 feet away and you have to put up with it. So I just question the, the um, boundaries. And if you ever get to the parking and trees, I'd love to um, weigh in on that as well. I don't know if that's part of this or not. Well, interestingly, Freddie, because you and I have been speaking, uh, this is part, this whole environmental controls is part of a larger sort of um, concept, you know, effort based on the conservation like laws. And so after you and I spoke, I just went and looked at Westboro's, um, this section of their bylaw. And the <coughs> next section is, uh, you know, uh, zoning on requirements for trees at, in parking areas. It's actually the next part of this law. So may, maybe, you know, this is more expansive and it's not ready for, you know, prime time right now, but maybe we can think about um, something like like that. If we, so I, if I understand what, what you're saying, that we don't have um, uh, 
requirements for parking areas, is that correct? We do not. We do. We do. We do. My, my point was okay. different. I was reading what was in the packet, so I thought this was relevant okay. because it was in the packet about having trees in parking lots somehow. But we do have a requirement. Okay. What we don't have is a shade requirement. So given that we know we're entering this higher heat events, go to a parking lot almost anywhere and try finding, you find the trees, but try finding some shade to park under. And when you don't have shade to park under, what I'm seeing is an increased number of cars also comes because you can leave your car running when you're um, not in it, leaving the cars running to keep the AC on. And yes, we know it's illegal, but try calling the cops to say, oh, there's a car running with, you know, and nobody's in it. So they're not gonna get there in time. and. That's not the kind of call they're going to come to. You can park under shade. It can be 10 or more degrees cooler. None of our shade, we have tree requirements in parking lots, but there's no, does it cast off any shade? And I can tell you, try on a really hot day. I actually parked in the sun and I left, I was nearby, so I had my keys on my, um, on my dash. And I came back. I couldn't. I couldn't start my car. But it was burning hot. And um, that temperature. You know, we know dogs dying and stuff, right? You shouldn't leave your kids in them. But why aren't we requiring? If we're requiring trees in parking lots. Why aren't we requiring that they cast some shade? And I haven't heard of that. But when I saw your um, packet, I thought it was something to consider because I actually was at um, National Park Service. In Concord, and so it was a park, but all of the parking lot was in the shade. And it was just so nice to park your car and come back, and it wasn't, you know, 200 degrees and stuff. So just something to think about. Thanks. So, is this something that you want to call the little layer? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'd like to look at other towns, right? I mean, um, I've seen really comprehensive. Um, which pages and pages, and I thought this was very simple. But um, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to take a look, take a crack at this, and um, do a little more work and come back if that's okay. Sure. Anything sure. else on this? Okay. Anything else on this, Jesse? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Planners report. Do we lose her? No, she's still there. No, I was talking to myself. <laughs> um, all right, quick couple things. Um, 250 Turnpike Road for uh, has submitted an application for major site plan approval. They don't uh, meet the lid threshold, apparently. Um, I believe they've indicated that in the narrative. Um, so that's coming down the pipe. It's a it was an existing office building that they're um, changing the use to um, a self-storage facility. So that triggered the threshold for major site plan approval. So we've received that application and filed it with the town clerk, but it's in the process of getting advertised um, this week, um, put in the newspaper along with the public hearings for uh, the Warren articles, same time. Uh, so that's coming up. Um, the open space inventory for um, fiscal year 2022, I have a, a, a substantially complete report received. I want to just take the opportunity to review it a little bit more, make sure there isn't any um, inconsistencies, and then um, we'll be getting that report 100% finalized, and then we'll get it on the agenda probably in the October time frame, um, per usual. Um, as you were aware from the emails I sent, the um, state extended the provisions for remote hearings until March 31st, 2023. Um, so that's what's happening there. Um, therefore, those public meeting requirements were a quorum in person and a de you know all that is um, pushed back until March 31st. Um, let's see, Debbie talked about hers and special town meeting. Um, again, it's October 13th, 2022. 
Um, and once we have confirmation, there is a draft warrant that has been circulated. Um, it's the initial draft, so it's pretty cursory, um, but the warrant articles for the public shade tree protection, the scenic roads, and then there is one for the revolving fund, which we, for the tree fund, but we'll replace that with the um, replenishment fund if we can get that together, so. That is the update. We don't have any meeting minutes this evening. I'm still reviewing it. As you know, um, Colleen prepared the draft and provided it to me. Um, we've been a little bit swamped at the office, so I'm about halfway through reviewing them for the internal review, and then we'll get those out to the planning board to review for the final review for approval. Um, and I think that's it. Next meeting of August 4th. Yeah, next meeting August 4th to write a letter that August 22nd, September. Very good. Motion to adjourn. And do I hear a second? Second. Very good. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Luttrell, yes. Mills, yes. Stein, yes. Again, yes. Mary, yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank oh, I just want to check you. in. Mimi, um, is um, is um, Bridget there? She is. All right, She's excellent. She's still smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and Bridget, we'll touch base tomorrow. I'll talk to you. You can let me know how um, how it's going. Thank you, Bridget. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Bridget. Thank Hopefully, you. you love doing this. <laughs> 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 so, Colleen would love you to love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Colleen, what are these? Are we supposed to sign something? Yes, that was my next. I was going to oh, cut Ken's the meeting plans. down, but yes, we have uh, two sets of plans to sign. Okay. And, and Mimi, there. Yeah, be Once aware. There, um, they did update uh, sheet C two and C uh, six to include the term wetland in the company's name, so it's proper. The correct com company name. Yeah. Yes, and also note that there is five sheets that are from the surveyor of the topography. Those don't have planning board endorsement lines on them because you're not endorsing that topography. Right, okay. All right. Very good, thank you. Good night. Talk good to night. you tomorrow. Thanks, Colleen. <laughs>